Good morning, you're very welcome along to Tuesday morning's OTBAM. Big show for you this morning before 9.15. We're going to be chatting to David Myler. We've got some NFL with Mike Carlson coming up after 9 o'clock and there's going to be plenty of hurling, plenty of golf uh, in the hurling. It is kind of ratification season at the moment. Liam Sheedy is back in the hot seat with Tip and with the golf. Well, it is Ryder Cup season and uh, to that end, Michael Verney of the Irish Independent is with me in studio. Good morning to you, Michael. How's it going? Good morning. So is this one of these weeks where you're like, does the, the golf fan in you really come out a little bit more or are you the, the sort of golf fan where it's like, no, if the four majors is fine, I don't care about the Ryder Cup. I think Tiger has kind of brought out the golf fan in everyone, hasn't he? Like, it's yeah. just amazing. The buzz, like Sunday evening is no longer like, you no longer like thinking about Glen Row back in the day or anything <laughs> now. It's now it's just like everything is focused on Tiger and that kind of charge on the fourth day. And I, I think you know, Ryder Cup organisers would be absolutely delighted like the publicity they're after getting now. It was obviously going to be a big deal anyway, but the publicity on it now is just massive. He's just box office. Everybody like the scenes going up the eighteenth the other day were just phenomenal. Like and that's just that's what he brings. And I'm just actually reading his uh, his biography at the moment to oh, yeah? uh, it's just Phenomenal, like the one that was written last year. Yeah, the two the two guys is over two hundred and fifty interviews uh, done with like obscure in kindergarten teachers and <coughs> gardeners and all. It was just the insight into him, and sometimes it's great actually. The insight into someone is better from other people than themselves a lot of the time. Yeah. But the insight into him and how fanatical he was, and you know, chipping balls into you know washing machines when he was two, and been on t TV when he was two, and he was just he's been box office from day one and even though he's a poor Ryder Cup record I think he's in kind of negative figures for a Ryder Cup um, the publicity he's going to bring to it is just great and everybody just wants to see how he's going to do I suppose Yeah, do you like Tiger uh, like as a man? Um, well after reading the book and some of the things you'd be kind of questioning but like I think I think everybody can associate with the the comeback story and any particularly anyone who's played any sort of competitive sport like he's had four he was, had four back surgeries since his last PGA Tour win um, the mental demons, having people like it, having, no matter how strong you are mentally, having people say you're finished, you'll never win another tournament, you'll never grip a club properly again. I think everybody can associate with that kind of comeback story. It's phenomenal, and I suppose, yeah, it's just, it just, I wouldn't be that major of a golf fan. I'd follow the, the four majors, as you said, and something like the Ryder Cup, maybe in the Irish Open and those type of things, but this just draws you in every Sunday night. Not even every Sunday night, every Thursday when you're finishing work or whatever you want to know how he's doing as yeah, well. Yeah. And it's, it's just great. Like It brings the buzz back because it had disappeared and while there are great golfers, Jordan's beating these guys, there's not the same, it's not character, it's just like when he's between the white lines or between the ropes, it's just, it's this steely focus that everyone yeah. can just kind of buy into. It's quite hard to put your finger on it, isn't it? Because the very thing that defines the likes of Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas, I would say, is that steely determination. It is probably the very thing that certainly defines Jordan Spieth, is that this fella is unbelievably competitive. He's got a singular focus on being the greatest golfer in the world and potentially to become one of the greatest golfers of all time. And that's what defines Tiger as well. So it, it, it's a very hard thing to put your finger on exactly what it is that separates Tiger from that bunch. It kind of is, yeah. I suppose a lot of it is, like, when Tiger was in his pomp, I don't think there was a greater sports person. Like he was literally unbeatable. If you go back through back through his um, his stats for some of the years, some of the years, like he was winning like thirty eight or thirty nine percent of the tournaments that mm -hmm. he competed in. Like he was winning nine or ten tournaments out of, would say, twenty in a year. Like, and everybody knew that if he was on, like we were going to have to play the best golf ever, just to even be competitive. And I suppose that just draws you in. And you were saying about whether I like Tiger as a man, having seen him at his unbelievable best and then to see him broken down and you know the string of media stories and the, the obsession particularly in the tabloid media everything he did um, everyone he was associated with came back out and he was basically broken down as a man yeah. and miraculously he's been able to build himself back up it's phenomenal because anybody who's fallen from grace it's very hard to to climb back up and he's done he's nobody's had a greater fall probably than him yeah. and he's He's made the climb, and I just, everybody's kind of thinking now, can he get a major? If he gets one major, chances are he probably gets two or three. I think he's three off Nicholas at the moment as well. Like, and nobody would have said that he would. He was written off basically. I don't know if you saw that. The, there's a video kind of doing the rounds of. I'm not too sure how how legit it is. I, I think it's uh, very unlegitimate, sir. But even, so, so even the comments that people are making, like, you you would be hearing this, you know. Yeah. And I'm sure he's having that self doubt himself as well. And 
to be able to build yourself back up again, like in all the kind of the personal kind of problems and everything, it's it's phenomenal what he's done. Yeah, it was kind of I think trendy in the United States on those shows and ESPN and stuff to actually just destroy Tiger. Like in that video you're talking about, like there's Colin Cowherd's in it and Stephen A. Smith, and it was just kind of like the dumb thing to to like just absolutely kind of berate Tiger Woods in the media. Like the thing about it is, it's just the beauty of the sport as well that it allows that bounce back ability even when you're at a stage in your career where in any other sport it's a career ending injury like etc etc like you put it into hurling terms imagine Kilkenny fans watching Henry Shefflin back out in Crow Park like that is what yeah, this yeah, is yeah. and that is why there's just such an explosion of Tiger Mania at the moment it's mm -hmm. the thing that you thought was gone and you, when it is gone you're like God, we probably should have appreciated Tiger Woods a little bit yeah. more. I think, at the, I think at the Augusta dinner last year, I think he as good as admitted that he was finished. I think Nick Faldo came out and said yeah. that he as good as admit, admitted and that he was saying finished. saying that he was in absolute pain sitting down yeah. at, at the, the, the dinner before the Masters last year. Like So it's just a complete miracle. Like He was saying that at the start of this year. and like We, we were saying this on the show yesterday. You do wonder, though, at his age now, has the end of the season perhaps come a little bit too soon? But if, of course, the Ryder Cup is this week. Tiger Woods perhaps doesn't care about it as much as the majors, but certainly we care a lot about it uh, when it comes to watching Tiger, watching him in a highly competitive environment. So there's going to be plenty more golf uh, on the week uh, here on OTBAM and on all the off-the-ball channels. Let's tell you what's coming up on this morning show. We're going to be uh, hearing from Mick O'Dwyer in a couple of moments, Mark Trassa was chatting to him at the Michal Murray dinner at the weekend. Uh, he's been chatting about commercialism in the GEA and a little bit about uh, his own career and memories of his own career. David Myler then is coming up at 20 past days. So I was chatting to him over in London last week at the launch of FIFA 19. Hurling in 2019 then uh, is coming up at around quarter to nine. It's shaping up to be a good old year in the Hurling Championship next year. Liam Sheedy back in the hot seat, as I said, for a tip. That is the big news coming out of the Premier County last night. After eight years' absence, of course, shocking us all when he stepped down after the 2010 All-Ireland win, he is back there with Tip. And at 9 o'clock, the NFL rookies, Mike Carlson, will be up giving his top five offensive rookies in the NFL so far this season. We'll chat a little bit about Kansas City, chat a little bit about the Buffalo Bills as well. Great win at the weekend. But now it is time for the back pages. OTB AM. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a dedicated call centre. So it is still uh, Tiger Woods dominating the back pages, but for very different reasons this morning. He is kind of uh, kitted out in a suit. We'll start with the Irish Examiner, uh, stepping off that plane in Paris yesterday. Uh, continuing the journey, reads the headline here, has Tiger the stamina to be an American force in Paris? So all these pictures have been uh, doing the rounds yesterday of like uh, the US team standing on uh, the, the staircase coming off their plane. And I'm not quite sure, is, are they actually cool pictures or are they incredibly dorky pictures? Uh, the I think Davis Love and one of the other vice captains are two of the only people, and Patrick Reed or the only ones not wearing glasses. So yeah. Whether they're giving off the impression that they had an unbelievable flight and absolutely let rip or not, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a str it's a strange kind of it's a real kind of American kind of photo, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't imagine the European. Yeah, pretty pretty much actually. Yeah. <laughs> like all you need is some guy going around with a towel. Yeah. Kind of, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's kind of, it's it's a strange kind of one, but that's the kind of razzmatazz they bring to things. Like do you know what I mean? I don't think anybody else would uh, like pose for that type of photo or any other no. team even. Yeah. No, definitely not. Like. It's strange that they're, obviously, the fact that it's on in Paris, like a very untraditional location for the Ryder Cup. Obviously, it's going to Rome, I think, in a few years' time as well. It's going to be back in Ireland, hopefully, as well, in a dare manner soon. But kind of moving it away from those traditional confines, I think, is a positive thing. And like I was saying this in yesterday's show, the more we move away from the traditional idea of what the Ryder Cup is, the better. Because, like, Jack Nick is reading a few of his quotes. Like, I'm not sure are they, like, I, I presume they're, they're quite old quotes where he's talking about the competitive nature of the Ryder Cup, that it wasn't founded on the premise of kind of deciding who's better, Europe or America. It was almost founded on experimental terms where it was like, this would be cool if we did this thing. Whereas I think Nicholas's comments, if we could move away from that and make it uber competitive, I think we'd all be happy for it. Like, I think the highlight of the last Ryder Cup was Patrick Reed versus Roy McIlroy and the fist pumping, the geeing up the crowd. And if that can happen in Paris this weekend, I think we'll all be delighted. Like the very traditionalist golf fans perhaps might frown upon it, but I think it'll be fantastic. There's nothing like like putting a flag <coughs> against, would say, another flag, or do you yeah. know what I mean? It's just and the whole the the, um, the Americans, it's the Americans against against Europe. That's a it's a big thing. It's like a parochial thing in, in GA terms or that. People love that. You know, you're doing it for the you're doing it for the parish, you're yeah, doing yeah. it for the badge or whatever. And the the competitive element, like Patrick Reed, like uh, you'd be in, like you'd be getting messages in WhatsApp group during during the last Ryder Cup, and it's like I hate this Patrick <laughs> Reed guy, you know, and it's just like it was unbelievable because he just. 
he had everything bubbling to the surface. He's playing to the crowd. That's what it's, that's what it's all about. And I suppose some of the best ones. I know it, it went uh, it went a bit too far there a few years ago with some of the controversy and it didn't go far enough. For me. Well, probably not. No, I'm kind of I would kind of be uh, like a, a wrestling fan actually. Like so, you love you love all that kind of stuff and playing to the crowd and you know guys getting booed. You know you're a good guy, you're a bad guy. This kind of dynamic. It was I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, that's the drama that you want. I don't think um, it's been played out on like a friendly kind of man yeah, gentlemanly yeah, yeah. terms. It's, I know it's a gentleman's game, but I think you want that element of competition. So as a wrestling fan, would you have been delighted when the European Tour like had that walk-on music earlier on in the season and all that sort of stuff? Anything, anything like that, I, I think you should start introducing walk-on yeah. teams, <laughs> t- teams into this as well. It'd be interesting as well. Anything that kind of boosts the, the profile as well, it gets kind of people talking as well. Yeah, and it's, uh, anything, yeah, anything where it's G'd up a bit like that. Even Crow Park have done it now after the All-Ireland Final where the winners all the confetti and everything comes out. And I'm waiting for it like a WWE show at the start. There'll be this big pyro, of, you know, exploding <laughs> everywhere. Even when the teams come out and all the music and it's, they've kind of gone towards the, everybody's kind of going towards the US kind of pageantry thing and making yeah. it I suppose the Super Bowl kind of effect and the NFL effect making it as big of an event not just within sports terms but within you know showbiz and celebrities and music and things like that and I think that kind of draws more people in in fairness yeah there's nothing wrong with it like everybody especially when it comes to like the GEA and, and golf I think they share the sort of traditionalist value in that which is quite important it is quite important in terms of I guess the reason why it was founded in terms of nationalism and all that sort of stuff when it comes to the GEA but I don't think that that needs to be mutually exclusive from the idea of pageantry, as you say, yeah. and I, I, I'm personally not against that. I, I know people are quite vocal in terms of saying that, you know, the, 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 the All-Ireland Finals, for example, shouldn't turn into something like the Super Bowl. It would be a very interesting experiment to give Vince McMahon control of the Ryder Cup <laughs> or give him control of the European Tour or the PGA Tour. What would he do with it? Or vice versa, give golf chiefs You'd have control pre- of the predetermined WWE. results there, I reckon, <laughs> anyway. And just on anybody, because I always get this the whole time, and anybody that kind of slags off wrestling or whatever, right? The way I'd put it to you is this. If two teams are going out and there's a lot of people talking about Gaelic football and negative tactics and that, their sole objective is to win, okay? So sometimes it's not easy on the eye. Whereas in, within wrestling, their sole objective is to make you and me, the punter, happy. Yeah. So they're trying to put on the best show possible. So anybody like that says, oh, it's fake and all this kind of crap. Well, it's fake. Yeah, fair enough. It, it's, <laughs> it's scripted fun. That's the, way I, that's the way I look at it. And it's scripted to try and make it as enjoyable and as entertaining for you as possible. Who's your favourite wrestler? Favourite wrestler? Um, probably probably toss-up Ric Flair or Bret Hart, I'd say, yeah. Okay. yeah. They're kind of the, the older generation. The current kind of, the, the, I don't know if you're following, there's a 90s WWE Twitter account. Oh, uh, yes, I all, do follow that. Like, it, it literally, I have to leave it throughout the day. I don't look at it throughout the day. I only look at it when I finish work because you find yourself just spending an hour yeah. watching these clips. That was like the, the greatest generation of them all. And just, I love the bit of nostalgia and just looking back through that it. That was like, pre-attitude era, no? That was pre-attitude uh, 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 No, no, 90s, 90s would have taken in, 97, 98, 99 would have taken in the attitude era, you know, Austin, Rock, all that kind of Yeah, oh, without question. When best, anything, yeah. went, literally anything went. Yeah. Some crazy stuff. Let us know actually who your favourite wrestler was. You can tweet us at ODBAM or comment on the stream if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube this morning. We'll crack on with a few more of the newspapers. The Times Ireland edition this morning is leading with the golf as well. Woods holds no fear for us, says Bjorn. Uh, which uh, is an I love that obvious. It's so obvious. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the most obvious thing of all time. He's hardly going to say, we're absolutely running scared of the Tiger. Yeah. You know? Like, is, is this sort of cute tourism going on from Bjorn here, from the European team, where it's like, you're sure, look at Tiger Woods there, he's flying it at the moment. He's <laughs> well, listen, you know all about it now, <laughs> Ferris. You've lived through it. But like, he's kind of played down, he's kind of played up that this is like one of the greatest American teams ever put together. Yeah. But like, they have, they are, they are, like, like, Europe have a great chance as well, in fairness. Like, they have a, a pretty strong team assembled as well. It's going, to be, it's going to be interesting. And obviously, it being on home soil in Europe does help an awful lot as well. But you have to kind of, you have to kind of play it up down, in fairness. He must have someone within the GA, I'd say, advi- <laughs> advise them on his media business. I would say Europe care more about the Ryder Cup and therefore the incentive there, say if it's going down the home stretch in the singles on Sunday, there's, a, there's just a little bit more of a carrot there. I, I, like, it may be a very lazy thing to say, but I just don't sense... Like, I, I think Tiger Woods obviously has always been able to that criticism that he just hasn't put it in in the Ryder Cup and the reason why his results haven't been great is because he just doesn't care about it enough. And you can see why, you know, it's not a hugely lucrative thing in comparison to, say, the Tour Championship at the weekend. It's not hugely lucrative on an individual basis like the, the majors are. 
and that is the very thing that drives him. So it's hard to get yourself up for something like this, particularly when you are living in an environment where you see the Jack Nicholas quotes where it's like, this thing isn't about winning. Uh, but perhaps with Europe, there's kind of a different vibe about it where winning is really bloody important. I'd say Tiger cares a good bit more about it now than he did, by all accounts. Well, sure, as a yeah, vice captain, like yeah. he would have. But by all accounts, he was the most, like, individualistic person or, and that's probably what made him so so great and, and I think Rory McIlroy even said as well that you know the Ryder Cup wasn't necessarily a priority for him yeah but to be fair to be fair I have always got that impression the same as you that it does mean a little bit more more to the Europeans for whatever reason I'm, I'm not 100% why but as you said if it is tight coming down the stretch you'd hope that that would come out in some shape or form yeah kind of like the way the Americans approach it and this may be doing them a real injustice, it's just my view on this, is kind of like the way the American basketball team approaches the Olympics, that they're like, th this is a really important thing uh, to represent your country, an Olympic medal is a really important thing to have in my repertoire, but give me an NBA championship any day of the week. And I think that's how the Americans view the Ryder Cup in relation to, to, to other majors and stuff like that. But, you know, it's, it's, it's just br it's brilliant. I just love the team nature of it all, and uh, hopefully we will have a really good contest coming down the home stretch on Sunday, as I say. So, uh, the Irish Independent this morning. This is uh, the PGA story of the morning. Sheedy gets three years to turn Tip around. It's Colm Keyes writing here. So, Liam Sheedy is back as Tipperary manager. It wouldn't be a big shock to many people after what's happened over the last couple of weeks. We've seen this one coming. Is it a big shock, though, in the general context of things? Like, at the start of this year, if you, say, if you were told that going into 2019, Liam Sheedy's going to be back managing Tip, would you have been surprised? Massively surprised, yeah. yeah. No point in saying any different, yeah. It's, it's very easy when you're doing your bit of punditry and he's obviously got a high-profile job within Bank of Ireland. It's very easy to stay on the sideline. But uh, as I was saying to Off-Air, I think he's probably seen it maybe going south a small bit. And I think, he t I think not that he turned it down the first time, but I don't think it... Uh, I don't think it maybe floated his interest that much when he was approached first and then maybe he thought about it a bit more and realised that he could make a big difference if he came back. Like, I don't think it can be underplayed. Like, Sheedy is the messiah in Tipperary. Like, the lad, like anybody that played under him in two from 2008 to 2010, the time they had for him when he left in, you know, Lark Corbett and, and Brendan Cummins had been on the record when he left in 2010, it was like someone was after dying, like, and that's what the, that was the general kind of mood and it was like a bubble burst after winning the All-Ireland now and it's just probably the, the fresh injection of kind of optimism and energy that's needed there. And I think people are getting a bit carried away with like, maybe the age profile and that as well. Some of the, like, some of the guys, Potty Matter would be, you know, 28, 29 and Callan is the same and Brendan Matter and a few others. But like they won under twenty one All Ireland last month, yeah. and they won a minor All Ireland two years ago. Like there's loads of talent coming through. That he's got loads to work with, and I think that shouldn't be lost on people. I know it was an upset when they beat Cork, but like if if Offaly had an All Ireland under twenty one winning team, we'd be thinking we're going to win the senior All Ireland yeah. next year. Do you know what I mean? Like so, and there's like at least five or six that are ready to make a breakthrough there. I think him sorting out the spine of the defence and getting rid of these discipline issues that seem to be rearing their head is probably the big thing. Well, that's the thing. The, the thing about the discipline issues is that they're quite salacious, some of the things that we've seen or that have been thrown around around the camp, that it just becomes, like a lot of GEA rumours, just complete wildfire and it affects your view of the team. And really, if you just look at it in the cold light of day, what actually happened to Tip last year? Like, very, very close to beating Galway, who went on to win the All-Ireland. What happened this year? Would have a post from not getting knocked out against Munster. Who knocked him out? Limerick. Uh, Limerick went on to win the All-Ireland. So they were that close to the All-Ireland champions over the last two years. The idea that, li that Tipperary have regressed into the middle ground, I think is a bit of a nonsense, to be honest. I think they're still well able to, to contend with all the teams. The, the, the question really is that this is per perhaps the best batch of players, perhaps in the forwards, uh, like especially in the forwards, I would say, in the country, that perhaps are underachieving a small, but that you look at Galway and the way they were spoken about this year, that they were expected to go on and win another title, they were expected to go back to back, whereas people in tip, I would imagine, would have been thinking to themselves, God, that should be the conversation they should have been having about us. Yeah, no, definitely. I think it's a thing that's kind of thrown at them that they're one-hit wonders, or, you know, some people would say, you know, we w they won one in a row. That, yeah. seems to be, that seems to be the thing, and uh, I, I just think it, it does, it brings that like, sense of optimism. Anyone, anyone that maybe was making you know, incorrect decisions off the field, they would definitely be thinking twice, twinking twice with Liam in charge. I think his backroom team hasn't been announced yet, yet, but you'd imagine there's going to be a lot of high-profile mm. kind of people in there. Um, there's not going to be any stone unturned. Anybody who feels that they can offer something to tip, I'd say, will be going gung-ho this year. He just... 
he just has that kind of aura about him in fairness yeah. and, he, and he never he never dirtied his bib in the eight years by you know slagging off players or anything like that he didn't take the easy option and say that some kind of people do when they go into the media and kind of maybe talk about players and you know talk about certain things that have happened I think um, I think it's a massive appointment I could not have seen this coming until a week ago yeah uh, so we'll, there's, there will be more on that a little bit later on uh, on the show you can tweet us your thoughts uh, on the new tip appointment uh, tweeting us at off the ball uh, moving on to the Irish Times this morning they're leading with the golf as well. Tiger still has plenty to prove in the Ryder Cup, says Philip Reid. If this is the second coming of a better Woods, then it is going to be great for the game. He's bang on there. And European captain Bjorn says Garcia is in a good place. Like Garcia is one of the enigmas of this European team that most people would have said he didn't deserve to be there whatsoever, but it's Sergio Garcia. He's one of the, one of the great modern Ryder Cup players. It's like the, 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 he, he could be pulled to rescue this weekend basically it's like wh where where could this run of form come from where where could this spark that has been absent from his entire season come from well sometimes that just happens uh, in the Ryder Cup and uh, finally for me then uh, it is golf on the back page of the Racing Post as well Red Alert says the headline resurgent superstar Woods 8-1 to one to outscore his Ryder Cup teammates which doesn't actually sound like a bad bet uh, you've got a couple of the tabloids Mike yeah I have the Irish Sun here um Nice headline here. Croak of uh, gold for GA. So this is just about JP McManus' this unbelievable gesture uh, giving 3.2 million to the GA to be equally distributed amongst the 32 counties, um, 100,000 for each county board. I think that's, it's, a, it's a massive, massive gesture. And yeah. just for, it's going to seep down through all the clubs. Like just, I think there's 22 clubs in Fermanagh. They're going to get the guts of about, about 4,500 each. Like that's, that's huge. Like that's some amount of lot of tickets to be selling on a Saturday night or that. Like it helps out, it helps out some amount. Um, what would you do with it if your club suddenly had uh, four grand? Oh, you always, you'd always have bills to pay, unfortunately. Like, I don't think people realise the ongoing and running cost of a GA club, like between, between insurance, between your, we'll say, paying all electricity bills, everything down, and we've a kind of a, a pretty uh, a substantial kind of grounds where we are, and you're paying rates, and you're paying all different different things, and there's just bills every week that you have to pay, and uh, like you're looking at most clubs, well, smaller clubs anyway, a hundred thousand realistically operating costs mm. for a year. So if you're getting three or four thousand, that helps an awful lot and takes away from your fundraiser, and you don't have to be going around with the poor mouth standing outside the church or doing bag packing so in the local yeah. supermarket. You know what I mean? It helps an awful lot. And it's just it's a it's an unbelievable gesture, and I even saw somebody saying that maybe maybe it's a uh, kind of showed the GA the way maybe that they should have dealt with rugby and soccer been played in Crow Park and repatriated some of that money back to the clubs basically that put Crow Park together shall we say but uh, it's, an, it's an interesting kind of train of thought there as well but JP yeah, you'd be hoping that Tiger wins more tournaments and Limerick win more All-Irelands and to be more going to go back to more money going back to more county boards yeah absolutely uh, you've got a couple of more of the papers yeah I do indeed um, I have the Guardian here again it's, it's, all, it's all about Tiger on the back and um, Thomas Bjorn, we don't fear anyone. Europe can tame Tiger, says Bjorn. Um, interesting one here in the back of the mirror. Frank Lampard tells Yo Jose Mourinho we're both in a sack race. Um, again, good headline. The headline writers certainly earned their corn in fairness. And then just the last one here in the Herald. It is a uh, tough act to follow. So Staple, we don't have quality of Jack's team. So Frank Staple and just talking about how they could never basically go in the same shoes as Jack Charlton's team and it's hard to argue that at the moment with our current fortunes. Definitely. Uh, we should move on to the Daily Mail. I'm not sure we have a, a copy there uh, because they've got big news this morning on Declan Rice. I think you've got a copy there somewhere. Uh, here we go. Indeed, yeah. yeah. So uh, this is uh, the back page of uh, the Daily Mail this morning. Jumping ship, Matt Lawton and Matt Barlow. Blow for Ireland as Rice look ready to declare for England. So <laughs> this is... Uh, Relatively inevitable if you were of that disposition. Uh, I certainly was quite hopeful over the last couple of weeks. Some of the sounds from the camp, what we, we'd been reading in the Star, like Paul Lennon, saying that there was going to be talks with uh, Rice's parents and all that sort of stuff, and that the door was still very much open, and that Declan Rice, w like the idea that he was still deliberating had to be taken at face value, and I bought that, and I bought the idea that Declan Rice might well throw on an Ireland senior shirt when it comes to competitive matches in the near future. 
it doesn't seem that's going to happen. Uh, it seems that England have won the battle to secure the rights to Declan Rice. So a bitter blow because he's been so good over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, and sure, we're just crying out for, for someone like that as well, in fairness. like I think kind of the longer those type of things goes on and the more people that get in someone's ear, particularly, particularly at his club, and I know his chairman came out with certain comments this year um, about how he could be you know, an English centre-half in the future or whatever. Uh, the more people start talking to you, the more kind of that kind of starts infiltrating your mind. But I, I just wonder, like, how often would he play with England, mm. if, if at all? Uh, are we going to end up with a similar situation to the Jack, Jack Reedish case where he will play never, or at, at the moment anyway, never, or will he, like, will he get capped for England, especially with their, their kind of, their kind of got riches at centre half, don't they? Yeah, like the thing is with Grealish, you do wonder if attaching himself to a club like Aston Villa, uh, like the way they plummeted obviously out of the Premier League, that's just kind of postponed his uh, progression to the England team just for a little while because the club form isn't going so well. Gareth Southgate doesn't need to go to a championship game uh, to recruit players for the England squad. So, like, fair play to him for being loyal to Aston Villa is what I'd say, but I do think it's harmed his international career. With Declan Rice, I think the way West Ham are playing football, thanks to Declan Rice, they're probably, they look in a very good position to stay up this year in the Premier League. I think it would be a surprise if they got relegated at this point because they look to be trending in the right direction heavily at this point. So I think that that might progress a little bit quicker from his perspective. Also as well, when you look at the depth that they have in that position, quite a, a specialised position, as opposed to, say, Jack Grealish, when you have like, when he's going up against the likes of Sterling and Lingard, etc., etc. Like for Declan Rice, he looks at Eric Dyer and is like, well, there's a, a little bit of a weakness there. It's not exactly England's strongest position. So there is certainly a route for Declan Rice to get into that England team if he continues to go in the direction which he is. And to be honest with you, looking at him over the last couple of weeks, that direction is going right for the sky. Can I just ask you, like, I'm a casual soccer fan. Is he that good or are we, are we like, putting all our hopes in it and seeing every little good thing that he does? Oh, to we totally are. <laughs> but, the, it, like, as well as that, he it seems to be an exceptionally gifted young footballer. Like, just, I suppose, in the, the context of this season, like, at the start of the year, it looked like maybe... Declan Rice wasn't all that if we were to believe some of the analysis we were looking at uh, in that West Ham midfield when he was playing alongside Jack Wilshere and Mark Noble and then it turned out that Jack Wilshere was actually the problem he's injured, Declan Rice is back in the team that injury just happened to, to coincide with the international break which is perfect timing for Declan Rice to go right back into the West Ham team just as he was making all the back pages here in Ireland, playing alongside Pedro Abiang and uh, Mark Noble he looks far better holding the midfield and just the, the way he managed to marshal that midfield against Chelsea at the weekend was really bloody impressive although Johnny Ward was in here yesterday and he said he thought he was rubbish on Sunday which I think wouldn't be like Johnny to have a like comment to, to make now yeah, <laughs> to have a strange thing uh, but no he was mad at the match on Sunday so he's definitely the, the hype is real I would say about Declan Rice but you're right the hype while it's real, it's just been exploded to the point where we think that he's, uh, where we think he, he looks like the next Harry Canton to, to all of us here in Ireland. So it's a shame. Like the, just to, to specify here, Matt Lawton and Matt Barlow in that piece do say that he's yet to make a decision, but it does seem that he's uh, leaning more towards Gareth Southgate's side at this point, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, we'll bring you a couple of the, the local newspapers before we wrap up the Mayo News this morning, first of all. They're uh, leading with, I presume... Yes, the, the next this. Mayo. I think it's a great brilliant. headline. Yeah. The new Mayo manager job, if the cap fits. So that's Mike Solon on one side of the cover there, James Horn on the other. Is it an either-or decision? Uh, on paper it is. I, th I think James Horn, just even for reading some of the quotes after Westport were defeated the other night, he's over Westport in the Mayo Championship. I, I think he'd like to have Mike working with him, whether that's that's a dynamic that Mike obviously has his own backroom team put together and his own kind of ticket and James has his own ticket as well and has actually said that he's had a lot of CVs sent on to him with some very high caliber uh, people so he's, he's kind of saying that it's a big deal from a lot of people outside of Mayo, inside Mayo and outside of Mayo whether the two of them work together it would make very a lot of sense because Mike was over the under 21s two years ago when they won the All-Ireland he was obviously over the under 20s uh, this year when they got to the finals it would make a lot of sense and much like Tip as well I think people have a bit of a um, a misunderstanding of Mayo. Mayo have lots of underage talent coming through. Of that under-21 team, the one all Ireland, only five of them have played senior championship mm -hmm. football. So there are plenty more to come through, and of the under-20 team this year as well, there'll be plenty more of them. Obviously, none of them have played senior at all. So there's, there are plenty, there's plenty to work with, and even Horn was saying today that it's exciting times and he'd yeah. love to be involved. Like, just because the, the current team, a lot of them, are, or a good few of them, are you know, over 30 doesn't mean there's not loads of other good talent to work with. I wonder, do we get carried away a small bit when we look at, say, Limerick and the Hurling this year or Clare in 2013, where 
football teams are looking at them saying, why can't we do that when it's patently obvious that footballers just take a little bit longer to develop because it's, I guess, a less ba it's a sport less based on skills. So na naturally, the, the, the gifted hurlers are going to come through straight away in hurling or come through a lot quicker than in football. And Mayo might look at them and say, well, we won an under-21 title there a few years ago. Why, why don't we have uh, the next Kyle Hayes or the next uh, Keane Lynch coming through, uh, like whatever the Mayo equivalent is? Like, I think you're right. I think there is a well of talent there. I do think, though, it's just been a little bit slow coming through, particularly in the forward ranks. Yeah, they just still haven't got that that marquee forward. I, I don't like using the term marquee forward, but maybe a couple of scoring forwards coming into it. Kind of Connor Loftus was kind of talked about. He's been on the scene a bit, but uh, like again, like there's been loads. Like TJ Reid was a couple of years with yeah. Kenny, as was Richie Hogan. Some guys just need a bit more time than others. You'd hope that when he's 24, 25 that he'd be ready to make that big breakthrough. Ono Dunahoo played a good bit this year, Keane Hanley played a good bit this year, they hadn't played before, uh, James Durkin as well. Mm -hmm. They have introduced, and what I saw in the Newbridge game against Kildare was particularly two young fellas, Dermot O'Connor, who has been around, seems like he's been around forever, same as Killian, and he has been around yeah, for a long yeah. time, and Paddy, and Paddy Durkin, another young fella, stepping up, and it's those type of guys that are, will be expected to kind of drive it forward. Like Dermot O'Connor that night was just phenomenal. Like Future he, captain material. Oh, 100%, and he's, like, he was young footballer the year maybe two, three years ago, like he's yeah. only 23 or 24, and people kind of maybe forget that as well. I think they have lots to work with. As you said, though, it does take a little longer with footballers. It's just, hurling is such a, such a kind of dynamic game and because of the skill the, probably the more emphasis on skills you can probably get away with being mm. younger and kind of more mobile whereas football it just does it's natural it takes a bit like you take a bit longer to mature absolutely uh, let's have a look at the Irish news this morning they're leading with this uh, in the sports pages it is McManus's 3.2 million euro gift for GA clubs remarkable and McKinley says that he quit over a lack of player buy-in uh, right, we're going to be chatting to David Myler in a little while, but uh, before that, here is legendary Mick O'Dwyer. He was speaking to Maura Trassany Kallig at Saturday night's tribute dinner to me all Murr Hurtig. Enjoy this. I was watching the documentary about you a few months ago, and obviously I've known you for nearly as long as I've been alive or I've known of you. I suppose the question for me and for lots of people is, do you ever get tired of doing things, fundraising, campaigning, travelling? Well, I mean, if, if fundraising for any any society any sort of I think it's a good thing and if I can help in any way I think it's only right and fitting that I should I got so much out of playing football with Kerry and now uh, I came from the club in Waterman so I, that's the reason why I put so much back into the club again When we talk about money obviously when we think of Mick O'Dwyer we think of washing machines and sponsorship it's moved on a long way now did you ever envisage the day that the way we see now, for example, Dublin, the massive sponsorship they have, did you ever envisage the day that this to be the way inter-county football and hurling would be? Well, I suppose that it started, and we, I suppose we were the team that really started it with Adidas, first of all, wearing Adidas, when it was the thing to be done, and then we did the washing machines after that, and from there on the association took over then, and they have big sponsorship now, as we all know, but it, 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 has all, it was all started uh, way back at the small beginning, but it's no big stuff. And it's great to see the association getting so much money out of these big firms who have plenty of cash to spend. I think all the stronger counties who have been getting big money along the line should be curtailed now and cut down and put more money and more coaches into the weaker counties. I mean, if, if, you, uh, if you want to improve, the, all those counties, there's only one way you do that by putting plenty of coaches, put them into the primary schools, and if you do that, you'll bring on your game. Uh, Kerry is a county obviously very successful, but obviously the demands, demands in Kerry are very high. People expect a lot out of the Kerry football team. What do you think of the, the process that's going on at the moment to get a new Bonish store on board? Well, I suppose it's a tough job now, I can assure you. It's not alone a tough job, but it's a full-time job. I mean, if you really want to do a proper job, you must give it a lot of time. So managers are under fierce pressures now to produce the goods. And when you're in a place like Kerry, the demands are a lot bigger than most other counties. But I suppose we're hoping now that we'll get the right man in charge in Kerry and good management in there. And let's hope that we'll be back have you enjoyed watching football this year or were you maybe 
swayed by the hurling this summer because uh, to me and to lots of others it felt that perhaps the hurling is the one that took off this year and left football in its wake. Yeah, well, uh, I've always said it. Hurling is the greatest game on earth. There is no doubt about it. There isn't any other game to compete with it. I know it, it, there's about eight counties that can win the All Ireland title in hurling, which is great. So the aim now should be for this football to get up to the standards of that. At the present time in football, you have Dublin standing on their own. They're way out in front, but that will happen. You get highs and lows and valleys in every period. Dublin's day is their time now, but that will change in time as well. But there'll have to be a lot of work put in by the other counties to get to Dublin standard at the present time. That's what I was just going to ask you. Like Everybody says the wheel will turn. I suppose at the moment it, it's very difficult to visualise how it will turn because when you look at the Mayos, the Tyrones, the Kerrys, they'd be the ones seen to be kind of coming up in Dublin's wake, but there's still a huge gulf. I mean, if you were a manager of one of those counties, what could you do? Oh, the only thing about it is you'd have to change the system, train harder maybe than they have been doing, put more work into see Dublin have a big advantage. They can get their team together, I'd say, in an hour. They're all living around the city, which is very convenient. But most rural counties know all their players are away. They're in Dublin, Limerick, Cork, they're in the cities and they have to travel back for training and all that type of stuff. So That was something you were very good at, which was trying to make sure that the men you had playing for you, at the very least, had, had a job nearby or that they wouldn't have to be travelling if they could help it at all. Well, I mean, that's so forcing any banished door will have to do when he's installed is first of all go through all his panel and make sure that they're all set up in jobs of some reason or another within distance of training. And if you can do that, that's a big part of your job doing. We think of you, obviously, you're synonymous with success with Kerry, but you've also had success in other counties. And I always think of, I'm a Galway woman, I think of 1998 and what you managed to do with Kildare. What, is that even possible today now for a team that wouldn't be up in the high, highlights, so to speak, to be able for a manager to come in and lift them and to bring them to an All-Ireland final. Is that day gone? Has the game evolved? Well, I think it can be done, and I think I proved that when I went to Kildare. Just before I went to Kildare, Kilkenny had beaten Kildare in the Auburn Cup. So that will tell you the standard and how low they were. But with a lot of hard work and a lot of coaching and training, we had a good standard there and we could quite easily... I won that All Ireland title, but we lost three of our best players on the run into that All Ireland final. After beating the three previous All Ireland champions, we had beaten Mead, Dublin, and Kerry on the way through to that final. So that will tell you, if you put in the work, it can be done. Do you think, even in today's modern age, because that was 20 years ago, do you think it's still possible today? I think it is if you get at least 30 players who are willing to give a total commitment, but it must be total. You, and if you get a total commitment, it's quite possible to do the very same. Dublin did it. And I mean, we put 15 men on the pitch at any time, but the thing to do is to get them into real shape. And the way Dublin have the advantage, as I said, they're all in around the city. So we'll have to try and change the other system. We'll have to try and get work for our players in the county that they're from. Mikko there speaking to uh, Mar Chassa at the weekend. Uh, talks a lot of sense. He does talk an awful lot of sense. Like He said basically one of the most important jobs as a manager is to try and make sure that the 30 guys or the 32 guys on his panel are working in a close proximity to their training base and that does make an awful lot of sense. Um, we saw with the SRI report last week how we'll say Dublin had a lot less travel involved, we'd say I think it was an hour less on average than, than most counties, probably more actually. And um, that just helps an awful lot, just means you're home recovering from training an awful lot earlier, um, you're in bed earlier, you're not on the road, you're not tired, like some guys travelling, you know, it's grand travelling and doing a training session and you get the benefits of the training, but if you're hopping into a car for two hours, there's a lot less benefits to it then and you're almost, 
you're almost getting better and regressing at the same time as well. So that 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 uh, that makes an awful lot of sense. And a lot of the a lot of the top counties, as kind of saying to you there off air, the majority of the Galway hurlers as well are based within a close proximity mm. to Galway, and that it just it just helps an awful lot. Mayo, you'd, you'd have to actually just admire Mayo what they do, like even moving training to that loan sometimes during the year. Like the amount of guys that are based in in Dublin, even Tyrone's footballers as well, you know, Tyrone McCann and a good few more based in Dublin. It's phenomenal to be as competitive even as they are yeah. at that rate. It is it is a natural advantage that Dublin have. Um, work and job opportunities are naturally going to gravitate towards the capital. I don't see that changing anytime soon. But if you can, as a manager, you can get guys you know, a bit closer to home, mm. particularly teachers and things like that, it does, uh, it does help an awful lot. Yeah, like sometimes it's just a controllable that you can control, especially with the sort of thing like with lads. Uh, like from Mayo, wherever it may be, say out, outside of Cork, Galway, Limerick, basically there is a, a natural inclination that they will have to go to Dublin. They will have to to move far from home to whatever to to get jobs and certain careers and all that sort of stuff. And even just reading Sean Cavanagh's book recently, like he 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 talks about doing like a media event with Bernard Brogan a few years ago, where Bernard Brogan's there and he's got his pre-prepared lunch that somebody's obviously made for him, like what, what, their dietitian or whatever in, in the Dublin camp and Brogan's after picking up a box sandwich and a protein bar and stuff like that, that perhaps you've been dealt this hand and it's not a good hand and it is unfair, but ultimately maybe there are uh, there is a little bit more you can do to control this and make it a little bit better, i.e. like preparing meals for lads who are travelling that they can have in the car or whatever it may be, or perhaps like instructing them to stop twice on your drive down and stretch the legs or whatever it may be that again I'm not saying that like that they're in a good position here or that it's that it's fair it could because it is unfair but maybe counties just need to say well this is the way it is we need to control this and maximize this as much as we can to make this some sort of positive out of this you have to make the best of a not a bad situation but it would say a slightly negative situation I know that when Keen O'Neill was involved with Mayo, I think it was 2012 they had a lot of guys coming from Dublin and uh, back to Mayo so I think they organized a minibus for them yeah, and like that's that. Like I've had to drive home to trainings like at nights, and the hardest part is, me, you know, not being able to pull in for a snooze for ten minutes because you have to be back or whatever. If you have that situation, or you're getting to train home or something like that, maybe yeah. you can just relax. You can do a bit of work. You can nod or off. a helicopter like uh, <laughs> Jimmy Guinness. <laughs> yeah, that's at a different level altogether now. But um, it just it just does help an awful lot. Obviously, it's going to cost a bit as well, but you're hoping that you will gain the benefits of that in the kind of long run. Yeah, pre-prepared meals and things like that help an awful lot as well. And that's one of the biggest rushes, you know, as a G player. Where, where am I going to get my food? Or, yeah. you know, and there's, if you do eat something maybe that you, you know you shouldn't, there's that sense of, you know, regret and you yeah. feel so bad about it as well. You've done good work. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, in your, you, have, you probably haven't really, but in your head you have. Yeah. And it's just a slightly kind of negative thing that's seeping in. Whereas if you have a pre-prepared meal, particularly for the day you're on the road, or two pre-prepared meals, it just does help an awful lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Sometimes it's, taking it's, the, it's taking the work away from the player and just making life easier for him. Yeah. Uh, all right, we went over to the launch of FIFA 19 in London with thanks to EA Sports last week. Over there, we caught up with Ambassador David Myler for a chat about the new game, Irish football and gaming. FIFA 19 is released this Friday, September 28th. David Myler, good to see you. You're... Uh a mega celebrity around these parts, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> um, look, I'm. Most people are well aware I'm big into FIFA 19. I play a lot of FIFA 19. Well, I play a lot of FIFA, should I say? Obviously, FIFA 19 is the launch event, so I've been invited down. So I've enjoyed my night. So it's been it's been good fun. What's the new game like? A lot. There's a bigger skill gap, should I say? Um, they brought in new features with time finishing. Um, people who have played a lot of the game with the low driven shots used to be, you know, double tap shoot. That's obviously changed to the bumpers and shoots. So they've made the game a little bit more difficult. But no, look, I'm really enjoying it. Um, it's been fun so far. So I'm, hopefully it'll be very good for the next nine, ten months. Yeah, making the day more gif- difficult is an interesting one because ultimately when it comes to gaming at the moment, there are two paths you can go down. You can go towards a game that caters towards the casual gamer or you can tap into what is becoming a mega market, a.k.a. eSports. So FIFA, I guess have succeeded in bridging the gap between the casual players and the competitive players, which is what you need to compete yeah, in the esports of market. Of course, of course. Look, that was the biggest problem. Um, people were getting to the stage in FIFA where, I think it was FIFA 17 at first start where they brought in the, the Foot Champions Weekend League, where people would play 40 games over a weekend, and then they would qualify for major events which were held in like Paris, Barcelona, Amsterdam. So they bridged the gap into the esports. Um, 
a lot of other games are doing it so it was only it was only a matter of time because FIFA to me is the biggest game in the world you know football is the sport we all love mm. it's played all over the world um, so it was only a matter of time before they got there and you know what these these young pros are making livings from it you know yeah. they're, they're earning big money and they obviously create platforms on YouTube Twitch so they can stream record videos etc and then if you're good enough you make the events where there's big money up for grabs does it become a bit of a rat race around this time of year where everybody gets their hands on the game and suddenly it's like the first two weeks are crucial to, for whatever it may be ranking but most of all to actually get to a stage of advancement at the game quicker than all your friends or quicker as you say there than your actual competitors in your actual job that is paying yeah. your rent no you're, you're, you're spot on because obviously Xbox have had the EA access which is which became available yesterday about I think it was 2 o'clock 3 o'clock or something which is 10 hours um, you're able to play if, you, if you're fortunate to have an Xbox and have EA access so people are using that 10 hours wisely because it's 10 hours other people don't have okay. to obviously build your teams, like get yourself the higher ranking, obviously get up the divisions and especially get practice at the game because once, once the game is launched on the 25th or is released, should I say, really, then the weekend league starts, that's when the, like, the competing against you know, fellow pros comes and that's when you know, the money starts to become at the end of the end of the line and have you been trying to get in on the action over the last couple of hours or a couple of days since I you played got your... yesterday um, right. obviously I'm currently injured at the moment so yeah. I wasn't able to play against Norwich last night but I had a few hours in the afternoon um, so I'm trying to get ahead of should I say my my kind of rankings yeah but I'm not a million miles away from the pros yeah it's I think there's a general fascination with the YouTube channel your YouTube channel YouTube channel at the moment it's unbelievably successful yeah it's um do you know what? I had instant success. I was very fortunate. It kind of blew up. Um, obviously, a lot of people tend to ask me the question: Do I care more about FIFA than I do against football? Which is, <laughs> which is a bit to me, is a bit stupid. Yeah. I, I, I kind of steered away from YouTube. You know, when it gets down to the nitty gritty, when there's big games, I don't tend to play as much because I do it as a hobby. Yes. FIFA is still football, but it's, to me, it's it's a hobby and it's 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 a computer game. Whereas I I have I'm very fortunate, you know, to to play football professionally. Um, you look at tonight at, at this event, and you've got Wilfred Tahan stage, Kevin De Bruyne. I have played against those several times. So I spoke to both of them. They come up and ask me how I am, blah blah blah. And it's it's kind of like I get to use these players in the game, but I played against them in real life. Yeah. So it's a very unique perspective, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, you know, I'm very fortunate that, you know, I've been able to gain a following, should I say, and people who enjoy my stuff, because obviously I'm probably, I'm well, I am the only professional footballer who does it to the level I do. Um, so I'm probably a niche in the market, should I say. Do you think, that, yeah, that's, that's for sure. Do you think you're blazing a trail? Because does it suddenly come down to a situation now in, say, 10 years' time where if you're chatting to a footballer near the end of their career, you're not asking them, do they want to go into punditry or management? You're asking them, do they want to go into punditry or management or potentially even into esports? Because I think that is, like, obviously your character, your 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 presentation skills, so you're, you're emceeing out there and flying it. So that's part of it. But I think part of it as well is the fascination with a professional footballer playing the game as well. And I think that that's helped the appeal. So do you see a future in this that is actually kind of a standalone viable thing after your, your playing days? Like, I, I've been asked this um, previously tonight, like, I kind of would best sum it up as I'm, I'm more of a free spirit. I'm not tied down to anything. I started my coaching badges um, last summer, uh, a few months ago. Um, I felt that it was something I wanted to do. Obviously, as you said, I've gone into so the YouTube scene. I've done a bit of that. Um, as you said, I've done a bit of MC and hosting tonight. Look, I'm just kind of enjoying things. Um, I'm, not, I'm not shy in front of these people. I'm not afraid of a camera. I kind of try and be myself and try and be my own personality. I try not to differ I think obviously doing YouTube has helped me grow in that aspect but when you say what will I be doing in four or five years if I play for that much longer who knows who knows um, anything is open look you spoke about esports and um, I've actually been asked to invest in two or three esports teams right um, and where are they based all over the UK right okay um, obviously fully professional yeah so because people know I have a passion for it uh, it's something different than what I'm doing as my job um, so you know who knows look yeah. I've looked at every avenue of it we'll see any tips for anybody picking up FIFA 19 on the 25th of September uh, from your experience from what you've uh, played over look, your hours yesterday I think I think I think the best thing to do is there's obviously the skill games mm. um, go and practice them 
So the, the crossing, the finishing, the passing, just keep spamming the exercises for a while, maybe an hour, and just get the, the basic concepts. Because me, I went in yesterday when I started playing, I went in my first two games and lost my first two. Um, I think I've played 100 games in FIFA 18 without losing. Right. So, do you know, I lost my first two because I couldn't finish. I hadn't mastered the technique to finish. So unless you want to go straight in at the deep end, maybe maybe just start and, and gradually get better and then approach, you know, the more the more competitive side. I was playing a lad out there and I beat him. So that was my first game of FIFA 19 and might be my last one. I just want to go away now with my 100% record. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and one game, one play. win, <laughs> champion. Yeah, I like it, I like it. Uh, I must ask you about your jersey from the Wales match because it was donated to our studio back home by, my uh, by your father and you didn't know about it. No, I didn't. Uh, Look, <laughs> Um, you get most match days you get two kits well you do you get two kits you wear one most people wear one the whole or the first half and the second half um, I obviously kept the two jerseys um, it was to me it's the biggest moment in my career obviously captaining my country in such a crucial game against Wales um, you know, to win away um, I kept the two jerseys obviously my dad has a range of shirts in my house from my years of playing in the Premier League, international of all different players I collected. And he went, obviously, being court manager, he went to the off the wall studios and he, um, <laughs> he said they had some lovely stuff, you know, around the place. Conor Murray's a good friend of mine, he needed his boots up there. And he was like, you know, they've got all this, these fellas stuff. Like, so I was like, oh yeah, yeah. And he just set my Ireland jersey, but look, I have watched, as I said to you, I've watched some of the periscopes on Twitter. I've watched some of it. I do see my jersey. But the one thing I, w I do want to correct you, yeah. which I correct my dad, the boots you have aren't the match worn boots. Okay. Right. I do have them. I'll give them to you. Are you sure? Is that a deal? Yes, that's that's no problem. You can say, say it's a deal. <laughs> don't worry. Because, no, because I, I'm a man of my word. And my father's a man of his word. Yeah. And, but he he originally thought they were the, they were actually I think they were the game the boots of war against Moldova which was the game before right okay and I changed so he's giving you the wrong boots but I will correct that okay no I, th I think we're I think we're happy enough with those but any, anything else that we can get in the studio we'd be delighted to take the other thing when you mentioned your father there is um, in terms of I guess memorabilia or buying each other presents like the charity auction and getting him in to be Jurgen Klopp's assistant manager like I think anybody out there who's thinking of buying Christmas presents for their father we will never ever be able to do anything of that uh, that scale do you know what um, obviously uh, it was James Milner's match against Dillian Petrov's team and whatever um, I was at James Milner's charity event and I was sitting on the table with a few Liverpool players that I've played with in my career and whatever and I felt like I had to contribute something to the event you know obviously he's trying to raise money and, and uh, he's doing a fabulous and wonderful job and, and I just saw it and I thought you know my dad got me into Liverpool and my dad is like he loves managing like he's obviously managed the court you know and he loves it and he loves the aspect of the professional side where it's every day and obviously in the championships a little bit more in the Premier League where you're playing most times every three days and I thought you know what right I'd love to get him in a room with like Klopp and you know big players now obviously you know you had some some big names in there but the thing that makes me laugh the most and most people won't know this was um i had a friend who played in the game as well it's jordan henderson's best friend ryan royal right and ryan knows my father from my time at sunderland uh, ryan used to come to all the games and ryan said my dad was the exact same he didn't change like he supposedly gave Mika Richards a pat in the back and hit him like and Mika was belting out like will you relax stop hitting me so hard um, he was like a few of them were kind of laughing and joking and my dad was like no like yes it might be a charity match but we want to yeah. win um, and then Ryan Ryan actually missed the chance in the last minute and my dad had a few things to say to him after so yeah. he loved it and you know I'm, I'm happy yeah it's a uh it's a big day for Cork next Tuesday, obviously, as well, down with the Liam Miller match. You're obviously, uh, you're not going to be there, but your father's going to be there, I, I, I presume. It's it's such a, it's going to be an amazing event. And I guess, as a Cork man, you can't, I think most Cork people we've spoken to, like, they can't speak highly enough of the power of Liam Miller and what he did for Cork City and just how fondly he's remembered by everybody from that city and from that county and from all over the country, really. Yeah, well Look, I was fortunate enough to play with Liam um, when I was at Sunderland. Um, I couldn't, could not speak highly enough of him. A lovely fella, um, a wonderful footballer, great.
great guy. Um, obviously, it's, it's it's such a shame, you know, um, you, for his family, everybody involved, his friends, mm. um, such a young age. Um, it's just so sad. And, and what what gives me great pride and satisfaction is knowing that you know the, the people of Cork have pulled together, and obviously I've gone to extreme lengths to make this what it should be, and it will be a fantastic event. Yeah. And obviously then. It was the big talk of Turner's Cross and Parky Cueve. And then they were thinking like if it, like Turner's Cross is probably nine thousand at max and then you look at Parky Cueve's forty thousand and then for them to then change it and you're thinking, please God, please sell out. The pressure was on then. Yeah, because people you know, people want it out and then I think they had problems with ticket sales because there were so many people getting tickets and then it's fantastic to see. Yeah. And especially not only Cork people, obviously me being from Cork, you know, we love our lawn but the whole of Ireland like I know people who are coming from the west the north up around your neck of the woods Dublin do you know there's people coming from everywhere and it's fantastic to see and you know I I hope it's as, as a great occasion as, as 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 Liam was as a person because yeah. he deserves it and his family deserves it yeah here here definitely I think we, we all wish the best in terms of the event and, and how it goes on um, in terms then of Ireland next month obviously it's the double header it's going to be Wales and Denmark it's an interesting period isn't it I think it's so weird I think the fickle nature of football was really shown by the aftermath of the Poland match because it was only a friendly and it was a draw but it immediately feels like the mood music is a lot softer around the camp and that people are suddenly thinking to themselves wait a minute did we get invested in the whole cloud over the Ireland camp way too much here maybe things are nowhere near as bad as we all thought they were no but look I spoke I spoke before the Moldovan Wales game people were talking about our results against Serbia and what have you and I remember there was a big thing about um, there was a doubt there was a big doubt over the World Cup and obviously this is long before like Denmark or whatever we had Moldova and Wales to play so basically we felt in the camp we beat Moldova then we'd go and we'd beat Wales and the doubt was created outside of the camp and I said that in press and like, I felt that um, like no like people want to go on about the cloud round it and the argument and whatever these arguments happen all the time yeah. they happen daily in football does it affect the players no it doesn't it doesn't affect us we are there to do a job now I think people at times forget you know with the wheels game we were more disappointed or as disappointed as anyone else like people spoke about my argument with the manager I was frustrated we hadn't won the game yeah I had I spoke to you there a while ago about the Ireland jersey from that game where we played them. You know, like like that was like to me to me personally, representing Ireland is the greatest thing I can do in my football career. You wanna talk about winning a World Cup at Ireland or winning the Champions League five times and we would rather win the World Cup at Ireland. Playing for Ireland is the best thing and we were we were so frustrated and annoyed and disappointed there's so many adjectives that could go through from the Wales game like then it was kind of we need a reaction the players knew that you know we, we were frustrated as, a, as anyone else you know and I think the lads went out against Poland and played with pride and passion that probably we didn't play as players we didn't play against Wales it kind of like obviously got the quick goal and then you're kind of like whoa what's going on and then before you know we're two nil down like Bale scores the wonder goal and the game the game kind of passed us by and then I think like that's why the Poland result was massive because that's what desperate to not to prove anyone outside of camp but to prove to the manager that, that they, they deserve to be there yeah. and you know like even after that game after the Poland game I came into the change room Seamus Coleman was there and Seamus said what's wrong with you I was I was angry after the Poland game because we'd drawn to concede so late when we were so close to winning the game yes as you said it might be a friendly but Seamus said like come on like you know the lads have done really well and I was like I need I need a minute or two here because we should have won that game we shouldn't have conceded and the team that like Martin O'Neill has built like we were we were annoyed to concede that goal because we had seen games out the Germany games the Austria game the Serbia games the Wales game those games even at the Euros Italy do you know those those games we saw those games out and that's why we were a little bit disappointed but as you said it was also a good result against a good Poland team yes they were missing Lewandowski but the rest 
the rest do play all the time yeah. like Lewandowski you don't get me wrong he's a world class striker but I'd still back my centre halves yeah like that, that's kind of you, you just put it very well there as in things maybe were completely blown out of proportion because I guess when you have something as salacious as, as was out there I guess like this thing is amazing we have all the details of this therefore things must be horrifically bad but in actual fact if you actually think about the, the nitty gritty of it all maybe it wasn't so bad in the end but I, I think one of the things that's actually going to go completely under the radar when we look back at the crazy last month that it was uh, is yourself and Martin O'Neill sitting beside each other in a press conference that was amazing it was the captain sitting beside the manager or like your you're, you're captain for that next game or you were oh no you were just up for press that day my apologies and uh, Martin O'Neill was obviously talking about your uh, conversation in training and it was just two men up there saying yeah we've, we've had it out in training and that's just but the this, way it is. This, the, thing is the thing is the thing is these things happen all the time Arguments happen. Like people, people think like these things don't happen. Like in in like I spoke to my mother. My mother said, "What happened?" I said, "It's an argument. It's nothing. It's nothing in the managers I've had in the past that I've, I've not seen. I've not been a part of. Like I've had I've had full blown arguments with players in change rooms. Yeah. These arguments happen all the time. Like the thing that probably frustrated a few of the older lads was it happened months ago." <laughs> Like and it's it's coming up now when we should be focused solely on beating Wales and it like it and when they say like oh we're we're not thinking about it at the time people could say oh what happened but now 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 we just focus on the football yeah and that's all we want to concentrate on and it's not it's not about arguments it's not we all we're all there to represent Ireland we all want to win for Ireland we all want to do well for Ireland and I think at times people forget that yeah um. Should we, be, should we be positive for the future of Irish football? Yes. No, we've got some... Look, I, um, I read a lot, I watch a lot, I see a lot. Um, the DNA age of the Irish players playing the Premier League is becoming more difficult and difficult. Um, it is sad to see, you know, we don't have a whole slot. You know, we've got the Burnley boys, we've got the Everton boys, we've got Shane, we've got Harry, you know. There's not Cyrus, Dots. We've got, you know, we don't have... You look at the Irish team that, you know, John O'Shea, your Kilban, your Dunn, do you know I mean, Stephen Kerr, Shea, all them, they all play in the Premier League. Mm. But now the Premier League is becoming so global. There's players from, like, I think Brighton, Brighton Field and 11, a few weeks ago, that have 11 different nationalities. Yeah. Like, obviously, Big Duffy is representing them and he's representing Ireland. But it's becoming harder and harder. It's just a more diluted league, really, in terms of nationalities. Yeah, because... So. They're going and they're buying your Brazilians or should I say your South Americans, like, and then they're going into France, Germany, Holland. They're looking for youngsters and they're giving them, you know, chances in England. Yeah, well. it's very true, David. You've been so good with your time. Great to catch up. Thank you so much. Thank you for all that. Pleasure. Cheers, David. Thank you. David Myler there speaking at the launch of EA Sports FIFA 19 in London. Tomorrow we're bringing you a chat with Crystal Palace defender Mamadou Sacco. Remember that FIFA 19 is released this Friday, September 28th, and we can bring you David Myler's. Ultimate squad, uh, or ultimate, yeah, ultimate squad. So, uh, this is uh, presumably FIFA 19. So, you've got, uh, you go from De Gea at the back to Cavani up front, uh, and George Beston there. Now, that's a, I, like, I, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to let myself down here in terms of a lack of FIFA 19 knowledge, but clearly, your ultimate team is allowed to have players uh, who are no longer around. So, why he is the only former legend of the game that's in that squad I don't know but I assume it's a rare card Michael I'd say you're allowed one yeah you heard allowed one. Looks, Let, yeah. let's go with that you picked a pretty good one in fairness yeah uh, Modric and Pogba in there as well Neymar it's a, it's a strong old field it's a strong old team he's done well there David Myler I presume they're getting a team that's strong it's quite difficult to put together to be honest with you I haven't, uh, haven't put together a strong run of form on FIFA for a good number of years at this point just kind of uh, takes up way too much time, let's just say. Once I start, I just don't stop. You were saying that FIFA 97, or FIFA 96. Yeah, was, FIFA 96 was, or 97, I forget which was your one last it was. one, was it? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I used to find that as well. Um, here's, uh, a, here's FIFA uh, 97, uh, indoor soccer. That's just, like, childhood memories just flowing back here now, yeah. That, I just, I thought that was class. That and Formula 1 97 were my go-to, go-to games back in the day. We were playing Formula 1 97 still in about 2007, I'd say, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if games got much better than that, but uh, 
that and sensible soccer for the, the Mega Drive. And then we had the Commodore 64 at home. Some yeah. great games on that as well. International soccer, Flimbo's Quest. All these <laughs> games. Great games. Uh, just to show you the difference in the graphics, here's a screen grab from FIFA 19. It looks amazing, in fairness, uh, some of the graphics. We, we don't have that. We'll uh, bring that to you in just a moment. Um, the developments, like the graphic differences are just mad. Like it looks, even the, the new MMA game, you just see like it's literally, you're looking at it for a couple of seconds and you, then you realise, like that's outrageous. It is ridiculous. You look at it for a couple of seconds before you realise that's not actually a real game. Like it's yeah. not a real match. Like yeah. It's <laughs> Hard bit the old nostalgia there too at 97 though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been told here that EA has revealed more legends that will be coming to Ultimate Team. So following on the likes from Rivaldo, Johan Cruyff, Eusebio, Steven Gerrard and Frank Lampard confirmed in FIFA 19. Manchester United legends Ryan Giggs, Paul Scholes and George Best will feature in the online mode. So that's where he got George Best. Not to mention the likes of Chelsea's Michael Ballack, Real Madrid's Luis Figo, Corinthian Socrates being part of today's announcement uh, the legends will come with three different card variations each one reflecting different stats at that point in their career and even one of those icons will be daunting for any opponent to face off against in ultimate team so we can see that on screen there so best available in three different forms uh, the best one there the right w right winger at uh, a rating of 93 uh, so uh, yeah it certainly packs a punch uh, in the, the new FIFA game George Best so FIFA 96, was that, so was, was that your first FIFA and was that your last FIFA? Yeah, first and last I think, yeah. I think it back then as well, um, Ronaldo, Brazilian Ronaldo, and around that time when he was coming on the scene, I think he was called Calcio when he used to play with Inter Milan. I don't think they were allowed, I don't know whether it costs money to use names back yeah, then or a lot more, but he was called he was called Calcio in a lot of those er, early right. FIFA games, yeah. I don't know whether it was to do with money or whatever. It's such yeah. a, a pro-evolution thing to, to call him, isn't it? Yeah, I know it is, yeah, yeah. I just thought it was gas, yeah, but um, that kind of vintage, yeah. I was, I was just saying to you off air there, like, when you once you get into those video games, it's very hard to kind of get out of them. It's almost like, yeah. like a box set, and I was just saying, like, Tiger Woods was playing... Call of Duty, you know, eight hours a day, and was dedicating as much time to his gaming career as he was to his golfing career at one time. It can just kind of take you over at times, yeah. Yeah, geez, don't talk to me about Call of Duty. It took up like you, you were saying that he was spending eight hours a day, yeah. like during my school holidays. I, I, w I wouldn't have been surprised if I was tipping four or five at least. <laughs> like Call of Duty was absolutely ridiculous, and I presume that's what uh, all the kids these days are kind of suffering with when it comes to Fortnite and things like that. Uh, so I've just been told that. Ronaldo, uh, the f f so when it came to changing Ronaldo from A Calcio on FIFA 99, uh, for reasons unknown, Ronaldo was nowhere to be seen on FIFA 99. He was replaced in the Brazil and Inter teams by some bloke called A Calcio, as you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. who looked uh, more like uh, Crichton off Red Dwarf. Although a massive inconvenience to everyone, player editing mode made it possible to change. So there you go, there's your, your, there's your nuggets on Ronaldo. That's a strange one, I did not know that. Uh, let us know as well, what was your first, uh, first FIFA game? Mine was FIFA 04, when we, they had, uh, there you can see it on screen, Ronaldo v Football. So obviously he had his own game, his own special, uh, his own rights were there. But yeah, FIFA 04 was my first one, FIFA 2004, where you had the off the ball control, which was kind of the new feature at the time. Where off the ball control, I like, oh, I like it's, it. It's, it's perfect, it's perfect given the show we're on here. Uh, so God, yeah, it was like Thierry Henry, Del Piero and someone else on the cover. Oh, it's like, Piero, I think we all remember our first FIFA. I think, I think yeah. it's an important You never moment. forget your first on. you never forget your first. Exactly. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit of hurling. Liam Sheedy is uh, the new temporary manager, as we were mentioning earlier on uh, in the newspapers. So, uh, as you said, it's not something we would have seen at the start of the season, but I guess he sort of feels like that there's some sort of duty here to go back and try and pull Tipperary up again to the level where they're going to win another All-Ireland because they are close. They are very close, yeah. Despite, like, obviously a, ba a poor year this year and not getting out of Munster, but um, the, the potential is all there. I think Liam would have seen, watching all from the sidelines, he would have been probably a bit frustrated with, with last year in particular. And they just never, after the league final to Kilkenny, it's funny, they were going well and developing players throughout the league. And after the league final to Kilkenny, it was, it was the same the previous year when Galway beat them. It was just kind of a, a bubble kind of bursted. I think when everybody saw the five debutants named to play the first game against Limerick, it was kind of like, like uh, what's going on here? It's a bit like a bit mad. Five debutants is an awful lot. And um, Limerick obviously hit the ground running that day and had them on the back foot. And I think the one of the most pleasing things that, from Liam's point of view is like, they didn't play anything close to their potential this year, but they still showed outrageous heart against Cork to come from nine down. Outrageous heart you know, with the help of the, the ghost goal against Waterford to come back as well. And we're in a winning position against Clare. And I remember saying to one of the lads, I don't know what game I was at in Crow Park, but it was going on at the same time as the Tip Clare game, and Tip were up. 
I said, I said these boys now they're going to come. They're after they're going stink all year now, mm. and they're going to come back and they'll be the only ones that can beat Galway. Yeah, I remember saying it at the time, and that's kind of that's kind of what you feel with them. So it was a point or two either way. Like they could have had a, a much better year than they did, but I think you'd see an awful lot of potential. And as I said, they have lots of lots of underage players coming through. If they can, uh, excuse me, if they can sort out the riddle at full back, mm. um, I wouldn't write off James Barry at this stage, but. And say Brian McGrath from the under 21s needs to be kind of nurtured along and a few other guys as well. There's loads of talent coming through there and I think Liam would see an awful lot of potential there. And I think he'd, fair play to him for t- taking himself off the fence yeah. you know, and putting himself back in there. Because he he, like, he, he's giving up a lot now to go into this. He's given up an awful lot and probably financially as well, but he's given up an awful lot as well. And that has to be admired in fairness now. And I just think already... Like I think his name was announced at Tipperary County Board meeting, and there was there was no discerning voice. Like yeah. it's just like we have we have our man. We got we've gotten back in place. Probably the man that can stay. Like he remember he picked up from Babs Babs's reign in twenty twenty or two thousand seven, where Cummins and Owen Kelly were dropped and Tip were on the floor. Yeah, and he brought them to. I think it was a league title the next year. Munster, uh, league and Munster, uh, then a Munster, and then the All Ireland in 2010. Like so, yeah. and he's got lots to work with. He's coming back in in a much better position than he did initially. Actually, I mean, he is, sure. yeah, and he has the aura about him as well. And the young guys coming into the squad will be mad to impress this lad. And he's been away for a nice period of time. Yeah, eight years. Ha- is has quite the game a changed too much now? I wonder. I I, w- I wouldn't think so, to be honest with you. And you kind of have to remember as well. He, he's the manager. It's not. It's probably not going to be. He's going to influence the style of play, obviously, but whoever his coach coming in is will be probably the next most important appointment. Mm. And there's talks of talks of Eamon O'Shea. I don't. That would be obviously the dream team kind of back together again. He was only with Tip. Uh, he was with Tip up until 2015, so his hand has been his hand is still well in the game. Um, it'd be interesting to see who else he has involved. There's all sorts of names been touted out there. I don't think, from a manager's point of view, it's it's different now. You're still you're like the CEO. You're organising and taking everything in. I don't think the game will have changed too much because whoever he has with him in the backroom team will kind of have a massive influence on that. Comment in here from Derek Halpin asking, do you think Anthony Cunningham will join Sheedy at tip or go for the Dublin main job? Tip have never had an outside man in, in any capacity really, like as a coach. They had Keane O'Neill obviously in a strength and conditioning, but they've never had an outside person in one of the, would say, really high profile roles as in selector or coach. I'd be surprised if I'd be surprised if he's brought in there. Dublin would probably be a better fit for him, but I think Dublin would be mad not to give the the job to Matt, Matty Kenny. To be honest with you, really, yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think Pat Gilroy was obviously it was obviously there was kind of extenuating circumstances with him coming in there or going against uh, Gilroy for that job. It was going to be hard not to beat or to beat Gilroy to the post for that job, given what he'd done with the footballers already. And I just think. I think the cards have kind of fallen in place for Matty Kenny to be the next Dublin manager and he deserves a shot at Inter-County but what he's done with Kula has been phenomenal and he would have been given a lot of the credit for what Galway did in the early years of the, the Cunningham reign, 2012-2013 as well so um, I, I'm not too sure where Anthony will fit in there. You, you don't know obviously, I think he's still current favour for the job but Matty Kenny would be the, the next Dublin manager in my view. Yeah, like there's nothing to suggest that Anthony Cunningham couldn't work with Matty Kenny. The question is whether or not he would want to remain another year a selector when clearly it seems that he's interested in the, the main job. Yeah, well that's the thing you see. Um, but I don't know. He came back in as coach and maybe a coach in Dublin after being a county manager before that. And I kind of was chatting to someone about this recently. The coach and the manager's job are miles apart. Yeah. The coach is dictating their style of play, he's taking the sessions, he's very hands-on dur- during the sessions and you can have you can have a very, very positive relationship with players, you know, oh we'll, we're doing this and this tonight and it's kind of arm around the shoulder. Mm-hmm. The manager is not really as much like that. The manager still has to have that aura about them, it still has to have a small bit of fear factor. Cold, really. Yeah, they kind of have to be, yeah. As we were chatting to Brendan Cummins about it recently and he just said, the players can't know what the manager is thinking at any given time. The coach is different. So it depends um, It depends what situation Anthony wants to go into. Does he want to be the coach where he's very hands-on taking the drills or the manager, which you can't really be hands-on with yeah. coaching and drills and things like that anymore. So they're two completely uh, different roles. We were saying that Tip probably just needs that little bit of a push forward, perhaps sort out whatever is going on in the camp that is just allowing them to underperform over the last two summers. So they're close. Dublin 
are they well off the mark? Like, where are they at the moment, in your view? I tell you what, um, I would have re really been watched with interest them this year. I think they would have improved again. Like, you, Pat Gilroy kind of raw off the league last year. It was basically just, we'll just maintain our place in Division 1B and it's all about the championship. A couple of the performances in the championship should have beaten Kilkenny. Mm. A probably fairly dubious goal, I'd say, where Paddy Smith was fouled and Liam Blanchfield let, put the ball in the net. Could have beaten Wexford. Pushed, we'll say it was a week in Galway team, but they pushed them to a point as well. Um, be awfully, I think it was 17 points in, in their last game as well. They're, they're close. It would have been interesting to see what year two of the project would yeah. have been like. And it's kind of disappointing. It's from shame, that. Isn't it? I think everybody kind of just, because everybody, when Pat Gilroy came in, was kind of wondering, this, uh, it's a kind of funny kind of demographic of football man coming in here. But by all accounts, they had made serious strides. So their next appointment is huge because they can't afford to. I don't, they can't afford to have to go to the bottom and start building again. It has no. to be someone who's going to continue on. And that's why Cunningham, who has been involved in the current setup and knows all the players, or Matty Kenny, who has probably analysed every player to death in the county with regards to the club setup and cool that. It's, it's, it's either of them for me. That makes more sense. Yeah, uh, just a final point here. You're 2018 Hurler of the Year. There's been a little bit of a dispute about the shortlist. I think that just comes with the nature of having an extended season, extended, like just far more games and all that we've seen. People get a lot get quite attached to their take on who should be hurler of the year quite early in the season and you see a lot of them like uh, Mulcahy not being there I think was something that's uh, pissed off a lot of people mm. so who's if you who's going to get the gong next month or the month after next I should say it's November It's an interesting one it was probably one of three Limerick players that could get shortlisted probably Keane Lynch uh, Declan Hannan or Graham Mulcahy and be the nature of it is, is because there's two Galway guys and one Limerick guy the Limerick guy has an outstanding chance yeah. so Keane Lynch was 15-2 to two before it was announced. And now he's 2-1. Do you know what I mean? And he has it because the split... It's still a good bet. It is, yeah. The nature of the split voting will probably mean that Canning and uh, Pouring Bannion will take away or kind of offset each other. So Lynch could easily be hurler of the year. Um, who do I think is hurler of the year? Um, I, would, I'd st I think Joe Canning deserves it more this year than he did last year, but I don't think he'll get it. Um, I think Pouring Bannion will just about hold on. Just about. I think it'll yeah. be very, very tight though. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're going to have Mike Carlson coming up in about 10 minutes' time. Darren Cleary will be in as well, bringing you all the latest in the world of sport. But before that, uh, have a look at this video, Mike. Uh, this is from yesterday's show. This is Johnny Ward. Good MV, man. Exactly. Yeah. Another good racing man. Because loves the darts. Loves MV. Oh, yeah. Loves the darts, but he likes the dregs competition, the one... The, the one the BBC has on. The BDO. Yeah, the BDO. He's a Next massive side. fan. So when Michael is on, just make sure to discuss the BDO because uh, he's he's from Offaly and maybe he just likes hardship. I don't know what it is like, <laughs> but he likes the BDO over the PWC or whatever it is. Well, there's a dart special yeah. coming your way tomorrow morning from 7.45 on OTBAN. As promised, BDO, talk to me. There are two sporting events that I would like to go to. One is WrestleMania and the other is the BDO or no Championship way. at the left side. 110%. Uh, that, this was like a religion to me growing up. We didn't have the channels and we still don't have Sky Rat and like that at home. So it was BBC Sport, BBC Sport, it was the lakeside at Frimley Green. Literally lived and died by it. And anybody, people are going to text in now and they're going to go ballistic, but anyone that reads through their dart history, that's where it all started. Yeah. You know, the home of world darts. But until the other one got way better. Oh yeah, just because of an, in, an influx of money, obviously, yeah. yeah. But... And you haven't, like, I, I can I can completely appreciate anyone who loves darts. I love darts. But to uh, appreciate the BDO over the PWC, or the PWC, uh, PDC, uh, <laughs> is something else. Again, I don't I don't have Sky, so, um, and I just, I, would, I wouldn't watch it, to be honest with you. Right. It's almost like when somebody has a crack at the BDO, I would, like, see it as a slight against my family, almost. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? The BDO is, I've watched the BDO for about, probably about 25 years. Les Wallace, uh, Taylor started off there, of course. Steve Beaton, the Bronze Adonis with the moustache and everything. Barneveld won four world titles there as well. Just uh, That's where it all started. And just I think people uh, probably don't realise the fact now, they do a huge amount for amateur darts. Do they, yeah. Massive amount for amateur darts. They basically organise the whole amateur circuit in England. Um, it's funny enough, I remember being on a podcast before with Johnny and I mentioned about the BDO and we just I go, 23! You know, the scores <laughs> and things like that. But uh, I, I still love watching it and I'd, I would love to go over. It is... Um, the PDC is kind of like the X-rated version of darts, whereas the BDO <laughs> is the family-friendly version. <laughs> Uh, like you say, I'd love to go over as if it's some sort of pipe dream. I don't imagine it'll be too hard to achieve that dream to go to the PDO. Like, no disrespect to the BDO fans and people who go, I'd say tickets are okay to get. 
No, no, it's difficult enough. Right. Yeah, difficult enough. They did all be sold out at this stage, like long ago. The, the next year's one is in a bit of limbo at the moment, actually, because I don't think they have a sponsor, and right. I don't like the fact. That Can't imagine why somebody wouldn't want a sponsor. <laughs> I don't. If I had the money, I would, and I might talk to maybe JP McMahon yeah. and see what he has <laughs> out. But when it moved to Channel Four, it definitely lost a bit of its. The, the schedule and wasn't as good. BBC. Yeah. I never understood though, actually, and it's the same with the snooker. Why it could, does it be on so late at night? Like even the, the highlights of the world snooker on BBC starts at like you know half twelve and stuff like that. Yeah. But I the BDO I just I loved I loved the BDO and myself and a couple of mates at home like we would literally literally I not a fighting type now but that's the sort of thing I would end up in a row over easily no problem. Who's your favorite BDO darts player? Favorite BDO darts player um, probably go for someone obscure like Les Wallace who used to wear. Used to wear a kind of a kilt on stage. Right. Um, I love Barneveld. Barneveld, the original BDO Barneveld. What about currently? Currently, uh, champion in the last few years is Glenn Durant, who's Duzza. I love the nicknames as well. Right. They're all so, they're all a bit more kind of pub style kind yeah, of kind, of, kind of nicknames. Yeah, him or someone like that. Um, there's some oh, there's some great ones. Yeah, Albertino Essers back in the day. All these guys, Glenn Moody. Just oh, you wouldn't get them. They're pub. They're pub chores, and that's why I love about it. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna keep an eye out for Duzza this Christmas and Sheerman on Channel Four. I'm um, looking forward to that already. Uh, so Paul Ross has been chatting to Ger about his new book, The Hurlers. The full interview is coming up on off the ball very very soon he shared this pretty incredible story about an early GEA tour to the United States and they get onto this boat uh, leaving from Cove and they're heading for New York and it's idyllic the first night and day it's idyllic they're, they're meeting these Swedish women and Norwegian women and they're dancing at night waltzes and it's a beautiful still calm and they move on and the next day the storm hits and the storm throws them around the sea like no one's business and they're they see this other ship, or this a smaller boat, which has had the sail ripped off it and is cast aside in the tears, and they're even worse, and they basically vomit repeatedly for day after day, and there's people crying, and they want to go home. And it's, a, it's a, as you say, Harpenter, for what's about to come uh, in America, where this idea, basically 52, just over 50 athletes, between footballers, hurlers, and runners, and weight throwers, went over there, and... It was, they thought they were going to make a lot of money. They would stage athletic events, everything, and they would establish the GAA yeah. in the United States amongst the Irish community. And it was such a disaster, it's hard to explain. First of all, it snowed, like, <laughs> extraordinarily heavily. So a lot of events were cancelled. In New York, the hurley match was so fierce that all their hurleys were broken. They had to get new hurleys made of hickory, and they didn't last well. Um, they didn't last well either. They, um, they had a weight throwing competition where one of the weight throwers threw, threw his hammer and hit a child and seriously injured a child. <laughs> they had to cancel the last leg of it. 20 of the 52 didn't come home. I mean, why would you? <laughs> they, they emigrated. They stayed, they stayed in America for, for, for the rest of the times. And another dozen came home only to tidy up their affairs and go back. And so far from it being... And, and by the way, they only managed to get home because um, uh, Michael Davitt the leader of the Land League, wired them out a few hundred pounds to, to cover the cost, to get them home and to buy off the promoters who wouldn't yeah. let them leave without paying them. Yeah, that full interview is coming your way very shortly. There's Paul Rouse in conversation with you about his new book, The Hurlers. You're watching OTBAM. It's live with Screwfix.ie, championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. We're joined by another mega wrestling fan in studio, Darren Cleary. Good morning. Oh, and good morning to you. So... Other, you're not a big BDO darts fan, by the way. I wouldn't Let's be a big BDO that. darts fan. I'm sorry, Michael. There are no hassle, no. You, Mike, was saying earlier on that like you go to wrestling events in Dublin, not together, but like separately and stuff like that. That you happen to encounter each other on the wrestling scene in Dublin. I didn't know that there was a big wrestling scene in Dublin. The wrestling scene in Dublin, the professional wrestling scene in Dublin, is bigger than professional boxing in Dublin. It's bigger than a lot of League of Ireland games in Dublin. Like a, an OTT show at the National Stadium will get. 2,500 people, which would be a run for most sporting events over any weekend. OTT. OTT, over, over the top, the top wrestling. Top, yeah. Right, and who, is there like a standout star at the moment? Is there a standout brand? Like, why, why is it so strong? They, they just tend to be really good at talent spotting. So they sign all these big guys before they actually get picked up by the big league. So the first show I went to was last August at the National Stadium, and it was headlined by a guy called Mick Foley, who is a WWE Hall of Famer and does some independent dates. But out of the card of like eight matches, I think like 10 of the talent have been signed by WWE 
in that time since. That's pretty cool that McFoley was fighting in Dublin. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he wasn't doing too much fighting now. He right. was, uh, he's pretty, pretty, banged up, he's pretty immobile <laughs> at this stage. It's 20 years since he got thrown off the Hell in a Cell. But he was there and he was he was there to move tickets. But the gas thing is, that card, so many of them have gone on to actually be signed. And some of them have pretty prominent positions now in WWE development brands. Right, okay. That's that's very interesting. What is it like, real? Uh, uh, oh. come, on, uh, come on now. OTT. Is OTT real? Yeah. No, 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 there's no such thing. Like, there's I, no such thing as real wrestling. No. There is. Greco 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 Roman, Roman wrestling, yeah. the Olympics. But professional wrestling has, has always been not real, predetermined. It's, I never understand why people pursue this line of, is it real? Like, I don't say to Star <laughs> it's Wars... It's an honest question. I don't say to Star Wars fans, you know that's scripted and, you know, not real. I don't assume that <laughs> people who watch Star Wars believe that there's really Obi-Wan Kenobi flying above us and shooting. So no one who watches professional wrestling, I would say very much the minority, actually think, my God, these guys are trying to kill each other. Yeah, but like... Watch it for what it is. It's sheer entertainment. But the only thing I will say is, right, Mick Foley was thrown off the cell. They do fall off, like, it, it's not as if this is some sort of illusion, like, <laughs> it, 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 does, it does happen, like, and it does hurt, and they do pick up out, outrageous injuries, like, it's not, that wasn't some sort of mirage, like, it does actually happen. The, like. the big question I have about Mick Foley and that is, why? Why? Like, why would you do that because to yourself? Because I, I saw him actually speaking about it, because it's 20 year anniversary, and he was talking about, at the time on that roster, they had Stone Cold Steve Austin, they had The Rock. The Rock is one of the most famous people on the planet now, never mind wrestlers, he's an actual movie star. And they were all sculpted, chiseled guys who had a good look and really good charisma. And Foley was kind of portly and yeah, yeah, yeah. unspectacular looking. He needed to do something to be noticed. And when he got thrown off a, a cage 20 feet high by The Undertaker in 98, he definitely got noticed. Yeah, yeah. So just, sorry, to come back to OTT again. Why, like, so it's not real, but how do you follow the storylines? Like, I, I get the idea that people enjoy the storylines in WWE, you're watching it every week, but, like, you just go along to the National Stadium, and there's, like, two lads continuing their beef, and it's fake. It's like, what, like... It's once, it's once, they won't, they run shows once a month, so the National Stadium is, like, their big shows, they'll do three or four a year, and that's when they'll pack out. They do shows at the Tivoli, I think, seven, eight hundred people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, every, nearly every Saturday, the third or fourth Saturday of every month. So, a lot of the times, they might just get to big stars on the indies and put them together and have a match but for the most part they're building and they use social media really well social media is really lines. good like yeah, actually really in the good. video packages they put together are brilliant probably for small money as well and it would actually draw it would actually draw you in like you know it's very it's, it's brilliant I it's the atmosphere you have to experience it don't knock it until you try until you've tried it it's like yeah. a religious experience because when you get there it's like a have, religious experience it genuinely is because there's 2500 people who are probably skeptical when they get there at the start but are open-minded enough and they can never explain how much they'll enjoy it afterwards. Like, I convinced loads of people here, some of them who've never actually seen WWE know of its existence, but would s skip by if it was on TV. I convinced a couple of people who work here to come down to it and see what it was like, and they loved it. It was cans in the Tivoli, it was enjoying the spectacle, enjoying some of the ridiculous characters, and it's, it's like chewing gum for the, the brain, because you don't really need a whole lot of thinking to just sit there and enjoy it. And a lot of it, yeah, it's, it's fake, it's not real, it's predetermined, but when I see a guy get thrown 10 feet onto the floor or do a dive into a crowd, I know the crowd is real and I know the floor is real because I'm standing on the floor. <laughs> so you have a little bit more respect for what you're seeing. Like there was one stage that was on the Tivoli and there was a brawl broke out and it was like this hardcore six man tag match and a lad picked up a bin and hit another guy with the bin and it had been the bin I'd been putting my empty bottles in all night and the crack of bottles and breaking everywhere, I'm like, oh well, that's a pretty decent spot. I didn't see that one coming, but it's 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 well worth seeing. I have to say. Can I just say as well, like you know, we talk about all the great Irish talent. Like the Irish talent in the wrestling world is phenomenal. Really, you have Seamus, who is you know a multiple time, multiple -time oh, yeah, world champion. Yeah, you have Becky Lynch, uh, also from, also from Dublin, current women's champion. You have uh, Fergal David, fit, known as Finn Balor. He's from Bray as well, massive star, former champion as well. Like and that's currently now as well. Like so, like as Conor McGregor says, we do it all. Yeah, absolutely. I need to get along to one of these OTT events. Me and Vernie are going to go to WrestleMania next year. Yeah, well, if he's not uh, spent all his money going to Lakeside instead. <laughs> the BDO. <laughs> uh, what have you got going on, Darren? Well, we'll go to real sport now, on as you will uh, call it. The European Ryder Cup captain, Thomas Bjorn, says he couldn't help but be happy for Tiger Woods. The 14-time major winner completed a Lazarus-like comeback as he took victory in the season-ending Tour Championship over the weekend. We'll hear from the USA captain, Jim Fjork, in a moment. But first, here's Bjorn on Tiger's return and why it's good for the game. In the end, whatever it is, these 24 guys are going to do this week. You know, the game of golf needs that boost of somebody like him that transcends the game to the masses, needs him at the top of the game. 
to grab control of the off tournament early and and kind of fend everyone off. I think it was a, a good buzz in the team room. A lot of the guys stayed out there at the course to uh, to congratulate them. But uh, nice to have those two guys play so well and and uh, you know start us off pretty well this week. Dundalk can all but guarantee the SSE Air Tristy League title tonight. Stephen Kenny side host Derry City at Oriel Park. City's time as defending champions was effectively ended on Friday night when Dundalk were 1 0 winners at Turner's Cross. That means they have a nine point lead over their closest rival. A win at home to Derry tonight would seal the deal. That would be a 12 point lead and a far superior goal difference. Derry have been struggling in the league of late. They've lost four of their last five matches. Manager Stephen Kenny has been talking up his players. There is a massive, massive hunger. Yeah, to win to win matches and um, you know we've won nothing yet. We still have a, a tough game against Derry on Tuesday and a, and the semi final on Friday. So um, we have a tough week. Tuesday night will be a big night in Oriel with Derry coming down, and um, you know it's just a, a significant result tonight coming down because a record in the last couple of years in Cork in here we haven't done done as well. We haven't done that well the last couple of years here. So it was absolutely terrific win. Um, and you know the players have been so consistent like that's uh, you know 16 wins in, 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 in 17 and they've been just so consistent and uh, it's, it's credit to them really the Liverpool striker Mo Salah has won the FIFA Puskas Award for best goal of the season. The Egyptian strike against Everton in the Merseyside derby last December topped a fan vote, it should be said, from a for- shortlist of 10 stunning strikes. While accepting the speech, Salah tempted faith by keeping his speech short because he expected to win the Player of the Year award, which went to Luke Modric. Nothing to say much about that, but I'm very happy and very proud. I have to thank everyone who voted for me and looking forward for another award tonight. Thank you. Look forward to getting the award later tonight. <laughs> it was a bit cocky, wasn't it? It was. Didn't work out for Modric Scoop, the Player of the Year award, beating Salah and Ronaldo to that prize. The first time a Croatian player has won that. Brazil star Marta now has the FIFA Player of the Year award. More of them than Ronaldo and Messi. She's taken the top individual prize in women's football for the sixth time. Well, Porky Cueve will be packed to the rafters later today for the Liam Miller tribute game. The former Republic of Ireland international passed away after a battle with cancer. A Manchester United legends team which are just touching down in Cork, we understand. Here's an image just posted on Twitter. They're looking in good shape, apparently. Roy Keane will manage that team of United legends with the likes of Dennis Irwin, Rio Ferdinand, Paul Scholes, Gary Neville, Ryan Giggs, Nicky Butt and many others togging out. Damien Duff, Robbie Keane, Kevin Coban all feature in the Irish and Celtic side which will be managed by Martin O'Neill. Gates open at the Lee side venue at 12.45. Kickoff is at 3. Will O'Callaghan is there for off the ball. The gala dinner will be at the City Hall in Cork. It follows where a number of auctions will take place. All the benefits from today's activities will go to the Miller family and the Marymount Hospice. Well finally Rook be some good news for Munster fans today. Conor Murray's neck injury may not be as bad as initially feared. It remains to be seen how long the Irish scrum half will be out of action for but Jerry Flannery gave a pretty positive update from the coach coaching staff side yesterday. He told reporters that Murray is progressing well and is beginning to start contact training once again. Nice one, Darren. Thanks for that. One other story. This is from Mara Clune. Uh, a sinkhole after appearing on the GEA grounds. And this is a school nearby as well. Frightening image, isn't it? Bananas, isn't it? In fairness, like, it's basically after splitting the field in two. Like, um, and I don't know what they do exactly to stop that, to fix it, number one, and to stop it happening in the future again. Yeah, it's caused, caused havoc, yeah, in fairness. It looks, it, they won't have to put cones or anything anyway <laughs> for what happened to field, right? And boundaries, anything like that. There'll be some manager that will decide we'll do running in that. We'll train in that. Yeah, so the school is evacuated, roads are closed, and obviously the GAA club has uh, shut down, the, the whole ground was shut down obviously yesterday morning. Like that is, so it's, apparently it's after an underground disused mine for gypsum rock caused part of the land to collapse. So if you're interested in the science, that's why, that's yeah, why it happened. There's a quarry in so. the background there, yeah. yeah. So Egyptian it, yeah. rock, did you say? Gypsum. Gypsum rock. I was like, yeah. Egyptian rock. <laughs> well, you know, maybe, maybe that's a story in from. itself when we're on Yeah, mm. absolutely. So, Marikli, that's, so, that's unbelievable. Hopefully, they'll uh, be able to resolve the situation. I don't know how you go about actually resolving that. Like, it's uh, it's incredible. So, hopefully, they'll be able to, to get the school back open and to be able to, to get back up and running uh, in Marikli and GA Club. Darren, thank you very much uh, for joining us this morning. More OTT chat, I think, in the future on OTBAM. We need some. Are you going to come to OTT? Yeah, definitely. We'll go and do, we'll go and do, an report. We'll go and do a report. OTB at OTT. Yes. That's it, that's it. You're wasted. You should be in the branding department here. Uh, so more real sport now. Uh, Mike Carlson, good morning to you. 
Hey, how are you? It's a good, good day for those gypsums, isn't it? With Mo Salah <laughs> winning uh, his award. <laughs> uh, let's talk uh, rookies. We want, we want to. You know, guess. I think it, they it have big a news actually this morning. It is Mike Carlson's top five rookies. So we wanted to get your top five offensive okay. rookies. But you the- know, I love this sinkhole idea because I think what they were doing was testing it out. They've got a button in the coach's thing, and he pushes the button. The sinkhole opens. <laughs> Opposition falls into the sinkhole. And then, you know, it's all, what a terrible mistake. It's like the hole in Mr. Burns' office. In the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so as I say, we're, uh, we're going through your role of honour, I guess, your top five offensive rookies uh, this week, Mike. We, wa- we wanted to do it after, I guess, uh, the two rookie quarterbacks went head-to-head last Thursday night in Thursday night football between uh, the Jets and the Browns. Uh, so I guess we'll, we'll go for, from five to one here, uh, Mike. So at number five, you've got uh, Sam Darnold. At number four, you've got Saquon Barkley. At number three, you've got Calvin Ridley. At number two, we've got Quentin Nelson. And at number one, it's a new boy, finally, and I think he's going to be QB1 for uh, the Cleveland Browns, is uh, Baker Mayfield. Yeah, I mean, 32 minutes of play in the NFL, and he's already headed for the Hall of Fame. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Um, you can't judge these guys, really, um, on on this three games production. But uh, Mayfield really looked like what I thought he would look like coming out of college, which is kind of the upside of him was a Drew Brees. And he, he showed a lot of those same kind of qualities. Uh, good vision downfield, real, real good accuracy. They, they played they played so much better when he came in. And I kept saying, or I keep saying, Cleveland's got the, the quality on the team to be, a say, an 8-8 eight eight team. Um, they're in a tough division. There's going to be a lot of um, good defenses that he's going to face. But I think Mayfield's, he's got a good shot at it now, better than, than the other three rookie quarterbacks who – are, are probably all going to be in worse situations. Sam Darnold's at five because he's starting. He'll get better as the year goes on. The Jets are not that bad. They've got some talent. But we also saw the first appearance of Josh Rosen in Arizona. Um, we saw Josh a- Josh Allen have his first good game for Buffalo. And, you know, both those guys uh, also will, I think, be the long-term starters for their teams. The problem is, as happens in the NFL draft, the best quarterbacks tend to go to the worst teams, which makes mm. their life harder. And and you see the difference sort of with Patrick Mahomes this year yeah. as he sat for a year in Kansas City. And and the thing is, not that sitting per se is good, but what it does do is teach you how to learn about the game and to read defenses and things like that. And so he comes in, I think, a lot more mature than a rookie is. And, you know, you, you think of Josh Allen coming from Wyoming, um, which is – sort of in the second tier of the top tier of college football. He doesn't see the kind of defenses he's going to see Mm. in the NFL, and that's the big part of the learning curve. But, you know, I I picked preseason Saquon Barkley because a running back in the Giants' offense was going to have the chance to play right from day one all season long and run up some big numbers, and he still can do that. Um, He's on track to do – to do that so he's he's probably got a good shot quentin nelson has no shot because he's a he's a guard um but he's just playing like a veteran guard and and, and really good and we saw calvin ridley have a three touchdown game this week um in that offense in atlanta he's got a chance to have a really huge year as, as uh people have to play julio jones there's also muhammad sanu uh they need a red zone target which is what he's already become and the advantage for someone like him or or another receiver like dallas goddard the tight end in philadelphia or christian kirk who who who's at well kirk's at arizona so forget i said that hmm. but um they come in to good teams so if they find a role, they have a chance to be really good. Now, not necessarily to put up huge numbers, but I think Ridley does. So he would be my dark horse at that rookie of the year. Just on the, the rookie quarterbacks, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, naturally the, the highest draft are going to go to a crap team and therefore they're going to look a lot worse than they potentially are. But just in terms of learning the playbook, is it usually accepted that between the draft and September, there is enough time for each and every player to learn the offensive playbook oh, off oh, by heart. Yeah, you're, they're, they're able to hit you're, the absolutely, usually. you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's the easy, that's the relatively easy part. Okay. The, the hard part is is learning how to adjust what you have learned to what you see on the field. And you know, one of the things that people often overlook when you talk because you're, you're concentrating on things like arm strength and escapability, but the really great quarterbacks make most of the play before the ball is snapped because they see the way the defense is aligned 
and they know where they're going to go. And in a lot of offenses, a lot of the sophisticated offenses in the league, the routes that the receivers run are option routes where, depending on what kind of defense they're seeing, um, the receiver's going to run a different route. And I say route and route interchangeably. Um, and um, so the receiver and the quarterback have to be on the same page. And for a young quarterback, it's sometimes he has to make that read right every time. Yeah. Uh, and and hoping that the receiver will do that, and and that's the real le- that's the real hard part of the learning curve. Um, the adjustment to the speed of the game comes eventually, regardless. But if you don't understand what you're seeing, that's that's the hard thing. Yeah. So uh, Baker Mayfield, Mike Carlson's number one rookie uh, for 2018. Like, how how far can this guy go? I know he like we're literally basing it off Thursday night at the fact that he was picked number one in the draft. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, there's huge hype. There is form there from college. Like, I was personally a, a big Baker fan. As soon as on draft night, he replicated that Brett Favre picture, and I think that just showed a lot of confidence. I think he's he's got uh, like he's got a, like a real nice cockiness to him. I think I think it's fair to say that, Mike. Like, how high is this guy's bar? Is he potentially Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers level? I, I, like I said, I think he's potentially Drew Brees. Drew Brees um, yeah. he, he's got a, a very similar skill set. And coming out of college, he had a lot of experience as a starter, which is a good thing. Um, it, it, it helps you to evaluate him better. His completion percentage was always high. They play in a wide open uh, style of ball, even at, at Oklahoma, or as well, especially at Oklahoma in, in the Big 12. Um, the defenses are better that they're facing, but but still, it, it's relatively easy for a quarterback to read and see what's going on. But everything pointed to him being successful, except the fact that he's bare, you know just six feet tall, and mm. that puts off some teams automatically. But Drew Brees is you know listed, I think, at six one, but he's basically just six feet tall, uh, and a quarterback who can get rid of the ball quickly, who knows what he's seeing, who who can read react release um is what mayfield is and as long as hugh jackson doesn't ruin him in the next uh six games or eight games or whatever i think he'll he'll be doing pretty well yeah let, let, let's hope that doesn't happen uh, just a, a couple of quick points uh, from the weekend mike patrick mahomes or showtime mahomes as he's been christened by i think travis kelsey uh, coined that phrase in the wake of the game kelsey was also saying that i think he was asked by an espn reporter if Mahomes is indeed from planet Earth, and he did confirm that he is indeed from the same planet as us. <laughs> He's been unbelievable, as you say. He, he sat all last season. I think he played uh, in Week 17 last year. They beat the 49ers 38-27 on Sunday. They're now 3-0. and Just talk to us about this performance on Sunday, because this is the one which really moved him into kind of a stratospheric level. I know he, he beat, was it Peyton Manning's record of, I think it was 12 touchdown passes in the opening three games or something like that, and he's now on yeah. 13. So, uh, yeah. you, you, like, you can basically find a statistic to suit your argument in every case when it comes to NFL that's so statistics based. <laughs> but it seems that Patrick Mahomes is the real deal. Yeah, I, I think so. And like I said, I think he benefited from not having to to rush in and play last year. He's he's now knows the defense. He's watched he's watched defenses every week for a year. Uh, without having the pressure of having to beat them, and now he's come in. He's got amazing natural talents as well. Um, some one of his high school coaches sent uh, Rob Rang a, a video of him in high school doing exactly what he did in the, the real highlight of the game. He he was scrambling to his right, turned around or to his left, turned around and ran to his right. And as he was running, he flicked the ball with his wrist that traveled about 30 yards between two defenders and into the receiver's hand in the end zone. And earlier that day, this coach had sent Rob Rang a video of him doing exactly the same thing, but with the sides of the field reversed when he was in high school and he was 16 years old. And it was the same flick of the wrist, the same 30 yards zip on the ball. Um, His father was a major league baseball pitcher uh, he's obviously inherited genetic the genetic uh, coding in his arm to make to make it really strong. He's very heady. Um, he's in a great system. Andy Reid's taken over the play calling again. Um, the head coach in Kansas City, and I think they're you know they're on the same page. They're trying to make things uh, easy for Travis Kelsey, and they've got weapons. The Chiefs have so many weapons where they can create mismatches with uh travis kelsey on 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 safeties or linebackers tyreek hill who's who's like a very explosive uh very fast player that they stretch defenses out and that's going to make mahomes life even easier the chiefs have no defense to speak of and that's going to be their problem they can't win every game in a Mm. in a 40 to 30 shootout but uh you know as long as they are doing it as long as mahomes can put 30 or more on the board they'll be in every game 
Yeah, absolutely. They're one of the most exciting teams to watch in football at the moment. Uh, I did want to get your take uh, on the general tackle laws in uh, the NFL at the moment. We spoke a little bit about this after week one when it became apparent how stringent the referees are going to be on this. But Clay Matthews of Green Bay was speaking after the weekend saying, unfortunately, this league is going in a direction uh, that I think a lot of people don't like. I think they're getting soft. The only thing hard about this league is the fines that they levy down on guys like me who play the game hard. I don't know. I'm just going to keep playing hard. Maybe now pass rushers and guys getting after the quarterback, you just have to attack the ball. I've been playing this game for over 20 years. That's how you tackle. So we'll see. I mean, something's got to change because the league's not. Is something going to change here, Mike? It seems that there's a lot of people very, very unhappy with how these uh, laws have been applied. Yeah, it's funny. I, I was listening to uh, Mike Pereira and Dean Blandino, who were both head of officials for the NFL, and they're now both working uh, for television. And they were saying that they had been in the com competition committee meeting and, and or talking to them, and, and that most of the competition committee wants a change. Now, the strange thing is, first week of preseason, it was all about helmet hits. And, and what was or wasn't a legal hit. That's that's died down, and that, that so far has been not a problem. Um, I mean, it's still a problem with helmet hits that go uncalled, but there haven't been any controversial ones. The problem, as you've said, is with quarterback hits. And mm -hmm. Clay Matthews, two, two weeks in a row, has been pretty much done a textbook tackle sacking a quarterback and been called for – you with coming down with the full weight of his body on the quarterback. Now, unless you teach players levitation, there's very few ways of avoiding doing that. And the law or the interpretation as it was put out to the referees this year said violent or unnecessary uh, when putting weight on the body. And we can see that because usually it involves a second motion. Um, and Gakwe on Tom Brady in, in week two, first series, forklifted him and then did you were talking wwf before he did what wrestlers do when they put their feet on the ropes to get extra leverage <laughs> he, he, he you could literally see him get those feet up and then to put extra extra weight on brady as he fall that wasn't called but when i put that opposite matthews and that was called it made no sense at all and, and the point that matthews is making if it's all one motion and yeah. you're doing a tackling motion and you're not hitting him late, and you're not hitting him with your head, and you're not hitting him in the head, you're going to fall on him. And mm -hmm. it, you know, unless you make an effort to sort of put extra force into that, which is usually easily recognizable, you shouldn't be penalized. And I think that's going to – the problem with the NFL is they tend to be stubborn in, in making these, these kind of changes or changes of emphasis that they tell the referees to do. So um, it may be a while before they work that out, but they had said that they thought it was a textbook definition of the penalty and they were going to put it into the uh, film that they put out every week to explain refereeing decisions. They didn't. Mm. Um, so, so we'll see. I, and I think when you look at it, you know, Clay Matthews has, is absolutely right. Uh, and, you know, and even the quarterback he sacked, said that he was right. He didn't think it was a, a violent hit. And, and there was one on Aaron Rodgers by um, Kendricks the week before um, in Minnesota. And Rodgers said he didn't think it was a violent hit. You know, it, it, it's the game, um, yeah. as he said. I don't know if the game is getting soft per se, but they're, they're trying to keep players safe. And it's very hard to take a very physical game and um, decide exactly where to draw the line on what is and isn't too physical. Yeah. It's easier in wrestling. It's easier in wrestling. <laughs> Absolutely. If, if I'd known I, you were talking WWE, I would have worn my Terry Funk, uh, my Terry Funk Funk U T-shirt instead of my uh, Wesley and Lacrosse T-shirt in, <laughs> in solidarity with Bill Belichick, whose season seems to be falling apart. Uh, but it, it often does in the first four games of the season. Is Terry Funk your favorite wrestler? To, absolutely. Terry Funk and Manami Toyota, who was a Japanese woman wrestler in the 90s. Uh, she was the best performer I've ever seen. But but Funk is Funk is just a legend. Right. You're, you're going to have to come over and go to OTT Wrestling with us. We've, uh, we're we're going to go ahead next OTT. week. Apparently it's even better than the WWE. So I'll uh, tell you. I'll tell you. I'll do that in an instant. Nice one. Well, the invite is intended. Uh, Michael in studio here is delighted to have you over. Uh, we're, we're out of time, Mike. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to talk about the Buffalo Bills, but I, I take it that they're going to win the Super Bowl. So, uh, Mike Carlson, thank you so much. <laughs> I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't put a bet on it, but um, <laughs> if you want to believe, you can believe. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike Carlson there on the line with us every week chatting about the NFL. Uh, Buffalo Bills, of course, beating the Minnesota Vikings at the weekend, hammering them 
and uh, Josh Allen with a, a pretty good performance. Uh, so just a, a quick comment in here from Alan O'Clary saying, I repaired my old Sega Mega Drive and put it in the original FIFA International Soccer. It's virtually unplayable nowadays, but I played the life out of it at the time, and for that reason, it is my number one. I love that, yeah, yeah. But also, Terry Funk t-shirt, and Terry, yeah. Funk, Terry Funk is an absolute... That guy was still wrestling and he was like early 60s, absolute hardcore legend, fought in all sorts of barbed wire uh, matches, matches where things exploded in rings, oh, fire, geez. everything got caught in barbed wire once and ripped his chest open. Oh, man, Bloody hell. Unbelievable, yeah. And it's not real, apparently. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's still real to me, Dan, that guy, <laughs> that guy that, just yeah, like yeah. Le- loves the, the barbed yeah. wire and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's been enlightening this morning, Michael. Thank you very much. Something for coming different. In. Just two quick ones before. Uh, Kieran Fallon Jr. Yes. rode a winner, uh, rode his first winner at Leicester yesterday. I suppose a chip off the old block. It was a 25 to 1 winner, and I think it was his third ride. I think he's a 19 year old apprentice. Just something to watch out for in today's paper. And there's some interesting quotes with Josh van der Flyer, who uh, suffered a cruciate injury at the same time as Bernard Brogue. And I think they both got operated on by Ray Morn. And I think Dan Carter might have been over as well, doing some right. rehab with them as well. But uh, just really interesting. And the psychology of Van der Flyer's recovery and he kind of thinks that Brogan has one up on him because he got back quicker than him but uh, by all accounts from what I hear uh, Van der Flyer's absolutely fanatical in that and was fanatical with his recuperation that. but it's just interesting to hear two kind of sports stars from yeah. different kind of codes kind of bouncing off each other like that That Bernard Brogan recovery is going to be a case study for in some medical journal down the line it's not it's obviously not, doesn't have like the fascination of say like the Santi Cazorla injury but just in terms of that recovery like you say there uh, Van der Flyer we actually have this up on screen so he beat his comeback date by two months and still lost his fitness race with Dublin football star Bernard Brogan he wasn't telling me something he said he beat me by a month and a half so it's 1-0 Bernard uh, I don't even know that he was I didn't even know that he was in uh, Ray Morn who did the surgery came in and said I just did Bernard's there and you can be buddies like as you said Evander Fleer obviously a uh, very competitive person naturally every pr- professional is but he's also got a huge benefit of age on Bernard Brogan and still uh, Brogan got back quicker I suppose maybe as uh, it, it, there might be different levels to the injury and stuff like that that we that we don't quite know, but still that, that broken recovery is is going to be phenomenal in your thirties. Uh, yeah, savage, uh, it might be a career and an injury. Like just think of all the careers that were ended years ago before you know great re- rehabilitation and surgeries came in because of that. Yeah, it's phenomenal what you did. Yeah, Mike, thank you, thanks for coming in this thanks morning. More, more OTT, more BDO chat uh, soon, I hope. Uh, so off the ball is back tonight from 7 o'clock when the lads will be chatting Liam Sheedy and two of the stars of the Liam Miller tribute match, Kevin Kilban, Keith Andrews and Kenny Cunningham will be on on the Ireland Celtic team this afternoon and Kevin spoke about his preparation on last night's show. We'll play you out with that in just a moment. But just a reminder, if you want to get involved, you can buy a non-attendance match ticket for just €7. Euro. Details can be found at supportliammiller.com. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Good luck for now. You know, what kind of uh, silky skills are we expecting to see on show from no. Kay Kilban at uh, Porky Queef? Well, Rich, when has there any been any silky skills on show from me? Uh, maybe maybe post-1999, n- I would say not. So uh, You might say putting your head down, <laughs> kicking the ball beyond your full back and trying to chase after it is not a silky skill. <laughs> I suggest otherwise. That is a skill. Yeah, well, so did I. Yeah, I made a... I made a uh, well, I said I made a career of it until about 1999, so there you go. Once, once the leg started to go ever Slide so slightly. Slide into midfield. Yeah, mm-hmm. there you go. Um, no, looking forward to tomorrow. It should be a good day. Really, really good day. Um, you know, it, how many people will actually be at the game, we'll, we'll see. But I'm, just, I'm looking forward to um, just getting back out and playing 11 aside again. I was on to Kenny. I spoke to Kenny earlier on this afternoon. Uh, Kenny's worried. That's all I would say. Kenny's worried. Why is Kenny worried? Kenny's been out in the park with a ball. He said, I had, a, I had a, the ball pump, pumping the ball up kicking the ball against the wall to start with, then I was out in the park doing little shuttle yeah. runs and everything. Kenny's actually been doing shuttle runs. I'm not going to lie, he came in here last week and he's looking, tri- like Kenny's not, there's never any fat ah, on Kenny. Kenny's fine. But Kenny came in last week looking very, like he looked like he'd shed a bit. He looked like he'd Did he bring in donuts? For this. Like no, there's was, no bake goods. Well, I was telling. That says it all. Yeah, but Kenny, Kenny never, Kenny even in his in his heyday, Kenny would have been the sort of fellow who would be eating full, full on desserts, he'd eat his donuts. Not a bother for Kenny, he would eat anything at all and there's not a pick on the lad. Never was. No, but he's after getting skinnier. <laughs> he's actually in training for this thing. Yeah. I, I think he's doing a bit of running now. That's what he's doing. There he's out go. running. Be wary. Nothing new. Mm. Be wary. OTB AM. Thanks to Screefix.ie. Championing the trade with a dedicated call centre.